Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Earl. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me out here to... Uh, to share with you guys. It's always an honor and a privilege. Uh, I must confess that I'm relatively brain dead uh, this morning. It was a really nasty flight from L.A. to New York yesterday. Um, um, actual pieces of the plane. The good news was it was inside the plane. Actual pieces of the plane fell off into the cabin. You know one of those flights where they suspend service and strap everybody in, right? My idea of a good way to spend the day. Right? <laughs> Horrifying experience. And uh, didn't sleep much. Had a couple hours sleep, but apparently that's all I'm going to need because here we are. Hi. Thank you. I was mildly intimidated by that. All right. So, uh, <laughs> I'll knock down some Diet Coke and uh, go. So, Something about these 12 steps, apparently. We're going to discuss those. I, uh, my disclaimer, not that I need one, but, uh, there's a lot of people who have lots of ways into the book, into the steps, into this experience, the purpose and value of it, their own styles, their own ways. Some people really love to get into the minutia of the book. You know what I mean? The, you know, like, uh, um, Okay, today we'll we be reviewing the ninth word <laughs> in uh, chapter three. Is it a German root? Um, you know, I mean, it just, it's just... I just kind of... When that goes on, it's just... I mean, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've never really paid much attention to the facts. It's always been about the feelings for me. And I, I'm the kind of guy that i got to feel it. I gotta feel it. I gotta catch a buzz. I gotta get that excitement going. I gotta feel like there's a way in for me. There has to be, I don't wanna understand my life. I wanna experience it. You know, I wanna be complete, as Joseph Campbell said. I mean, I, I wanna be, uh, um, present in the moment. I wanna feel life. I wanna feel love. I wanna feel friendship. I wanna feel purpose and value. I mean, it's understanding. It's never been that, 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 big for me and and it's always it seems that that's always come as a result of action that I've taken so for me I've always had to in in reading the book and in being in book studies and in and in 12 and 12 groups and studying this and breaking it down and going and listening there's there's so many great uh, uh, messengers in the program there's so many people that have different ways my thing has always been that I got to keep my eye on the prize, you know what I mean? And the prize for me is, is that I can become a man who's comfortable sober, right? That Because for me, sobriety, this isn't about stopping drinking and using, it's about staying stopped. How do I stay stopped? How do I have the process of recovery be, uh, lay that down upon the process of my life? That's, that's what I'm after. I'm after finding a way to make it possible for me to uh, um, live a life that has a code of love and tolerance, as the book suggests to me, that ours is a code of love and tolerance. And I think it's interesting that they suggest um, that to me, I'll speak for me, um, I think it's interesting that they suggest to me that I should lead a, a life based on a code of love and tolerance. Where the, out there, they're talking about love. You know? In here, it's love and tolerance. They put, they throw tolerance right up there because they know me. They saw me coming. <laughs> you know, I'm notoriously intolerant of myself and of others. I'm a self-centered, frightened human being. Alcoholic. I mean, I mean, I was talking to somebody and uh, there's a book study in my living room on Thursday nights. Ava came in and spent some time with us uh, a few weeks ago in that very meeting, and I was talking to someone about, uh, um, and by the way, if occasionally I just stop talking and just, I'm just standing here looking at you, you know, just, <laughs> you know, and I'll be right back, all right? 
So, I, uh, what the hell was I talking about? Ah, um, we were in the book study. We were talking about the fourth step. I can't even remember why I was bringing that up. The hell with it. So, um, I've got to find a way in. I've got to find a way in. The only way I get in is by doing. It's not, to me, I don't think it's so much about understanding this. I don't think it's about, for me, it's not about breaking down the minutia. It's not about, as my sponsor, the late great Donald Madden, my original sponsor, used to say to me, you know, just, it's not about getting into it. It's about wrestling with it, certainly, on a certain level, and listening to the dialogue. I go and I listen to the guys that get into the minutia. I, I go and I get into, I, I listen to the guys who really, really, really want to break it down. And that's great, but at some point I have to live it. At some point I have to feel this thing. I have to be able to bring this sense of, this sense of what I've come to understand into the action of my daily life. I gotta get to a place where I'm comfortable, clean, and sober. I'm not gonna get that way until I'm relieved of the obsession to drink and use. As long as I got the beast whispering in my ear, I'm not a comfortable man sober. And I can't live like that, because I gotta live life on life's terms. Right? Um, uh, uh, whoever's running the show apparently has not read as Earl sees it. You know? <laughs> Be because what's rolling in my head a lot of the time and what's actually happening are two completely different events. I have to get in line with, with life on life's terms. And when it hits the fan, as it often does, I, and I recognize that I'm not in charge of the fan, Right? I've got to have some tools available to me to minimize the wreckage I will create in the frightened state I'm in when that occurs. Right? I've got to get, I've got to get a hold of some kind of balance. The only thing that has ever brought me back, I got, I got here, it was very clear that I had lived the life of a maniac. There was absolutely no balance in my life whatsoever. I was in the extremes all the time. I was either a victim or an assassin. I was never in the middle. You know, it was just, you know, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, I'm going to kill your family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was never appropriate in how I was responding to the world, you know. No balance. When I got sober, I was a sober man with no balance. I became maniacal in sobriety, right? I mean, I got to come into sobriety and they say, well, you know what, I mean, we exercise. I'm like, good, we'll exercise then, we'll exercise you know, and I exercise until I literally, you know, rip the muscle from the bone. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, working out and working out and working out. You know, it's like, something's wrong. I can't, you know. I ran until I had stress fractures in my feet and was hallucinating. You know, sitting in the back of meetings. How far did you run today? 13 miles. You know, and I came in with 74 broken bones. You know what I mean? So me running 13 miles is, you know, strange things are happening all the way. You know, snapping and bopping down the track, right? Became a workaholic, just no balance, no balance, no balance. What I discovered was is that sober, I was running from the beast. I was running from the beast all the time, trying to keep the beast at bay. Just that whispering in my ear, you know, that, that, that thing that's, that kept reintroducing the insane thought to me was based, I've got 16 years of, of experience that says for me to drink is insanity. Yet I would be Standing in the back of Ohio Street on a Saturday night, where my, si my sponsor was the secretary, I had the cleanup commitment, surrounded by the guys that we were all sponsored by Donald, right? I mean, I'm in close. I'm in. I'm in the action of sweeping up a meeting. And the beast would appear and just, how you doing, Earl? You know, you're sweeping up and you just, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> You're having a very, very bad day. I can see that you're very, very stressed out. It's terrible. You're a wonderful human being. You're a lovely guy, and people treating you like shit all day long. I don't understand what the hell. It's a cruel. It's an ugly world, though. It's a cruel and ugly world. <laughs> and I can see that you're upset by this, and then uh, falling into what I would consider Earl a clinical depression. <laughs> so, um, oh, 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 your sponsor's. He's looking at us. He's looking at. Okay, smile and wave at your sponsor. Go ahead. <laughs> Very good, very good. All right, listen. First of all, we got to keep this just between you and me. 
uh, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out and we're going to just have a couple of drinks. Uh, 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 don't, don't overreact to that, Earl. Don't overreact to that. We're just going to go have a couple of drinks. We're going to unwind that spring inside you that's wound so terribly tight. We're going to work through this because I'm here for you. I've always been here for you, haven't I, Earl? I love you. I've never left. And we're going to work this out, and we're just going to keep this between you and me, and we're going to zip right back in. We're going to zip right back into the meeting. No harm, no foul. You'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. It's wonderful. I love you, I love you, I love you. Now I'm in the middle of, I'm, I'm sweeping up. I mean, I'm doing it. I'm in the meeting. Sponsors right there. Two guys I love dearly. My two original friends in life are standing over there. I'm thinking, well, yeah, that makes sense. See, I can't have that because that guy's going to jump up. The beast is going to jump up and talk to me and deliver to me the option of a drink. Until the planets line up just right and I'm just beaten down enough by life and I'm just depressed enough and I'm just isolated enough and I've stopped going to meetings just enough and I've stopped calling my sponsor just enough to get me to have a couple of drinks and isolate me from the pack. Isolate me from my kind. Now the minute I have that drink, I activate the physical phenomenon of craving and I got a whole new brain I'm having a conversation with. I do that, I relinquish the power of choice the beast is back in charge. And I got a whole different voice in my head now. Because he's been whispering and being nice. Because he has to. I give him a drink. It's a whole other kind. Earl, ha, thank you. I feel much better now. <laughs> and listen, uh, get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil. We got to write a few things. We got a lot to do today, all right? So let's just get the list together and get in the car because we're on our way downtown, okay? Now, and... And I know, Earl, you seem to need to act as if you're involved in this process in some way. You seem to feel like you need to be in the decision-making process. It makes you feel better. So, okay. All right. You pretty this up any way you need to. You want to weigh it out. You want to see, should I drink today? Should I not? Should I drink today? Should I not? You want to do that, go ahead. But we will be drinking today. <laughs> You know, and it was only in sobriety that I looked back and realized, you know, they're always doing this, you know, should I, you know, every, how come I never pick no? <laughs> Why is it that I never pick no? And you'd think if I was deciding every once in a while, I'd go, well, not today. Never happened. Always chose to drink. Always. So I got to recognize that for me to be comfortable, there's only one, the only way I'm going to stay stopped is if I can get comfortable sober. The only way I can get comfortable sober is if I'm relieved of the obsession of the mind, the greater aspect of the disease. I've got to be relieved of this obsessive thinking. I've got to get this voice out of my head. When I'm dealing with life on life's terms and I'm looking at the options that are available to me on a daily basis, drinking and using can't be on that table. As I review my options, that's not something that I'm considering. It's done. It's done. That's the whole point of working the 12 steps as far as I'm concerned. See, we got this triangle with a circle, right? Mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance I've sought my whole life and never had drunk or sober. That the only way a guy like me can experience any kind of balance in my life is if I'm freed from my addiction, if I'm freed from the beast, if I'm freed from the physical phenomenon of craving and the obsession of the mind, that physical allergy, right? I've got to be rid of all this stuff. I've got to get rid of it. The only way to do that is this triangle which AA adopted. Unity's the body. I bring it here. Right? I couldn't get sober, but we seem to be able to. Step one says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. I need to do that with you. i got to do it with you. I couldn't do it. I'm, I couldn't get sober, but we seem to be able to stay that way together. Right? That unity's the body. I bring it here to you. I gotta be with you. The recovery is of the mind, the greater aspect of my disease. How do I get relieved of the obsession of drink and use? Work the steps. That's what they're for. Right? Having had that awakening, the spiritual awakening is the result of working the steps. That was the whole point. To be restored to sanity, soundness of mind, relieved of the obsession of drink. The third side of the triangle, the spiritual. I can practice these principles and carry the message. I can be of service. How can I help you? But like the book tells me, I can't give away something I don't have. Right? I gotta do the work. I gotta get in there and I gotta wrestle with these concepts and these ideas. And I gotta try this stuff out. Right? I gotta try to activate this stuff in my life so that there's a feeling associated with it for me. It's like, it's, it's, it's the Zen way, man. It's like chop wood and carry water. That's the deal what we do around here, man, is we chop wood and carry water. Because I get up and I go to a meeting. Head says, don't want to go to a meeting. Thanks for sharing. Off to the meeting we go. Right? 
don't want to work the steps. Why? Well, I'm kind of big on that Herbert Spencer thing, you know. I'm rather proud of my ability to show a great deal of contempt prior to investigation. <laughs> you know, I don't want to. I don't want to. Why? Because I don't know anything about it, and I hate being bad at anything. If I can't be good at it immediately, I don't want to play. It's the way it is, right? I don't want to be the newcomer, right? Go to the step study, first step study. Hi, what's your name? Earl, complete idiot. Step. No information about this at all. Oh, good. I, what I loved was my sponsor. I remember when I first went to him and asked him to sponsor me. I was, uh, I wasn't even human. I mean, and I went to him and I said, you know, respond, huh? to which he replied, what? Said, Will you sponsor me? And he said, yes. And you don't have to like what I tell you and you don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. And I went, okay. And then put my head down and started to cry. <laughs> Because I had just asked somebody for help, and I, you don't realize you haven't asked anybody for help in years until you do it. And then you think, my God, I haven't done it. And I just started to cry. And he looked over me at, to his assistant, Jeff, and he said to Jeff with a big smile on his face, Oh, wonderful, he's destroyed. <laughs> and I remember that I looked up like, Oh, my God. This is the guy I've got, I picked. And, and I now come to understand, well, of course he was thrilled and delighted to see that I was destroyed. I had been beaten into a state of reasonableness by alcoholism. He wasn't going to have to convince me of anything. He was just going to tell me what to do, and I was going to go do it, because my ass had been kicked. I wasn't going to debate things with him, because he it was very clear. You know, my best thinking didn't get me to AA. It almost kept me from ever getting here at all. So I became this kind of, there was this willingness on my part that he found delightful, that all my ideas, I tried them all, and we'd all been beaten into the ground together, me and my ideas, and I could come and he could just say, do this, do this, do this, do this. And as a result of the doing of it, that I could have an experience, all right? So he was looking at me like, could we get to one here? We got an hour for but one, and I don't blame you. <laughs> we know, uh, right? We, it's always funny to watch the people where, like, Ava's, Ava's one of my dearest friends. I love her dearly. We have a blast every time we get together. She, she shows me around New York. We have a great time, right? She comes to LA. She meets my wife, you know, and comes to our home. And it's very nice. And, uh, and, and she was, and she was being, she's a perfectly reasonable woman. You know, it's remarkable. I mean, she's a very reasonable person. She says, you know, okay, here's the schedule we're going to do. You know, you got six hours, so two steps an hour, 50 minutes, 25 minutes a step, a little break for the smokers, you know what I mean? A little body break, well, we'll move to the thing. And I'm listening and I'm thinking, that's a very good plan. <laughs> that's a very good plan. And I'm just so concerned that I'm the weak link in this plan. <laughs> Because <laughs> we never know. I know. I I knew who knows. No one ever knows what I'm gonna say. It's such a crapshoot. Who's speaking, Earl? Is he good? We'll, we'll see. <laughs> it's different every time, and it has to be different every time for me. It has to because. Got to get between those, man. Guess it. Right in there. There's nothing but right now for me. It's got to be right now. Right now. That's the thing that working these steps, the, per the value of this, the buzz that's available is that. That we can be here together this morning, this place, right here, right now. There's nothing else. Because this is where our lives are. There is, there's, we're not having lunch now. Odds are we're gonna. Odds are. Can't do anything about the fact that many sirens in New York at night. I got two hours sleep. Can't do anything about it. Must let this go. And be here now. And have fun. And look into the eyes of my brothers and sisters. And know that I'm safe. 
right? We're on the ground. We're not in a plane. We're here now. This is good. This is good. And that the steps give me back right here, right now. I mean, when I was drinking and using, I like to go down. I like heroin, alcohol, barbiturates. These are a few of my favorite things. These are the things that I like. My idea of a good night sitting around checking my pulse. But if I can't get those, I'll take a big bag of the cocaine. Let's go up. I'm perfectly happy driving the freeways, decoding license plates. You know? Psychotic. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy doing that. Right? Because it's not, ultimately, it isn't about up or down. It's about I got to get out of right here, right now. Because right here, right now, I'm self-centered. I'm afraid. Right here, right now, I'm fe dealing with feelings. Uh, can I, can I deal with them? I, I can't even, I can't even name them. You know? I just know that this feels terrible. I'm afraid. I'm not, I'm comparing your insides, your outsides to my insides and I'm losing every time. I'm not a comfortable human on the planet. You medicate me effectively, I can go out into the world. Right? I've got to find, so the thing that I'm trying to get away from with drinking and using is right here, right now. My alcoholism robbed me of now. So how can I live life? How can I be free? How can I know God? How can I be a friend? How can I love you? I can't love you in 20 minutes. Well, there, there are those that would disagree. I'm <laughs> an, Sorry, an inappropriate thought floated by. <laughs> I'll just let that go. You get what I'm saying, don't you? Right? Life is now. I've got to be present in this. I can't, I can't be of service. I can't have purpose or value later. Now is the only time I can do that. So that for me is, is like just to kind of frame up, that's why I work the steps. That's why I involve myself in the steps, to be relieved of the obsession of the mind, to be able to experience some sort of balance and inner peace, and be present in the moment, to be relieved of the obsession to drink and use. Relieved of it, which is what I think brings everybody into the, the semantic debate of recovered, recovering, recovered, recovering. I'm just, I can't even get into that. You know what I mean? It's like, am I recovering? Yes. I do not suffer from alcoholism in the slightest. I have no obsession to drink or use. It's not even a thought. It doesn't even occur to me, let alone be obsessed by it. Am I recovering? Well, yes. That this is a process, and I move towards unobtainable absolutes in my daily life. Right? Everything that I do now can be done much better than I'm currently doing it, which is great news for me. Because if I get the buzz from doing this stuff, what that means is there's a bigger buzz ahead. That I'm going to know a greater peace. I'm going to know a greater love. I'm going to know a greater honor. I'm going to know greater discipline and as a result, greater freedom in my life if I continue on this path. This is really good news. Because out there drinking and using, I mean, it just goes bad so quickly. You know? First little buzz, oh, secret to life. You know? My reaction to the first getting high was, I need to do this as often as I possibly can. <laughs> and I did. What I didn't know at that moment was what was going to happen, that slowly over time, the buzz I was getting out there is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and the price I was going to pay for it was going to get greater and greater and greater. So that in the end, I'm paying an horrific price just to get even, just to get to zero. I'm not getting high anymore. I'm not having a good time. There's no euphoria being experienced by me. I'm just trying to get out of the pain and the madness. Right? It's turned on me and it's chewing me to pieces. In here, it's the opposite. The more I do this, the more I chop the wood and carry the water, the bigger the buzz gets the more in touch I get with a spiritual life, the more connected I become to you. More and more and more, for me, the distance between myself and, and others is not what separates us. More and more and more, the distance between us is what joins us. And I feel more and more connected to my God and to my fellows. The inner self and the outer self of who I am become closer and closer and closer together. I mean, it's almost, you know, in that, that Eastern way, you know what I mean? That, that it's, it's, it's coming together. You know what I mean? It's coming together. And that's the peace and the grace and the dignity that a maniac like me can begin to move towards if I'm willing to work the steps. Now, having said all that, 
Step one. All right? I think we've laid a little groundwork here. Let's move into the step. Step one. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. Step two. <laughs> sorry, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they even went. <gasps> <laughs> step, step one. All right. Basically, basically what they're asking me is, what's the problem? What is the problem here? If I don't get real, real clear on what the problem is specifically that I'm addressing, how am I going to come up with a solution to that problem? I got lots of solutions. Screwdriver, excellent tool. Excellent tool. Solve a lot of problems. If I have a flat tire, this is really not of a lot of value to me. I got to know what the problem is so I can come up with the proper solution to the problem. The problem for me, lack of power is my dilemma. I may be, I may be, and the book talks about it a lot, talks about it in the doctor's opinion, talks about it in the first several chapters, talks about, I may be like normal man. It, it, it lists five different alcoholics. I have a book here, so, uh, third edition, I apologize. I don't have the modem to modem book. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I apologize for that immediately. Uh, I'll, co I'll come around to the fourth edition. I will. I'll come around to it. But I, you know, I just, you know, I like 449 being where it is. It comforts me. <laughs> <laughs> but it lists, um, like classifications of alcoholics. Um, it, classifications of alcoholics. And they're, you know, the psychotic, the one who's normal in every respect. You know, except when he drinks, except when the question of drink is involved. And I, you know, it's, luckily for me, I read them and I go, well, yeah, well, that's me. Then I read the next one, I go, well, that's me. you know, my hand just keeps going up. You know, as I read through these different, I identify with all these guys, right? I have to. Thank you. Saw that happen, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Back, girl. Come on, back. <laughs> Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. So what's the problem? What's the problem here? Lack of power is my dilemma. I have an obsession of the mind and an allergy to the body. I got a soul sickness that manifests itself in that way, in, 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 in the mind and in the body. I can, I can kick and be relieved of the physical phenomenon of craving, and the book refers to craving as a physical malady, right? I can kick. But I haven't I've dealt with a greater aspect of my disease. I have to be relieved of the obsession of the mind or I'm never going to be able to get comfortable sober. Staying stopped is going to be a remarkably difficult experience for me. And I don't want the struggle. I want the freedom. I'm sick of fighting. I'm sick of fighting. The book tells me i got to stop doing that anyway. So I don't want to live my life battling the beast. One of the most horrifying things I've ever heard of in my life, there was a guy... Um, who used to come to, I used to do a workshop every Tuesday night. I did it for five years. I'm on sabbatical right now for three months. It's got fried. And, uh, not unlike today. And, uh, this guy kept coming to the workshop and you could tell when you met him, 30 feet away, you thought, oh man, troubled fellow. You know? You could feel the pain on him. And it was very hard. And one day I walked up and I introduced myself and he said, you know, I've been coming to this and I've got almost five years of sobriety. And I'd love it if you'd sponsor me. And I said, of course I will. And we started to do the work and we were talking. And, and we were outside in the parking lot. Week after week we're doing this. And I'm standing there and I'm talking to him. And he was saying that he kept telling me about this friend of his that really didn't want him to be sober. Well, you know, get rid of him. You know, you got somebody standing between your sobriety or is in opposition to that. I, the, uh, my opinion is immediately that individual is removed from my life. I, I'm not interested in somebody who's going to work in opposition to my own well-being. And he would talk to me, and he would stop, and he would look away for a second, and then he'd come back and he'd talk to me. And I suddenly realized what was going on. The person that was in a, a opposition to his sobriety was in him. Um, he, when he got sober, it had been such a, rem a horrifying experience for him. He'd had a psychotic break, and there were two people living inside Jeff. And what Jeff did every single day was Jeff would wake up and sober, physically sober, 
and this individual inside him would begin to tell him how today's a good day to drink. And he would battle this other individual, a separate entity in Jeff's mind, about whether or not to stay sober. During the course of the day, this other individual would get drunk. Not with Jeff, but would get drunk and talk to Jeff as a drunk person. And go. And then so the next morning when they would wake up, right, this other individual who lived inside him did, didn't remember getting drunk, didn't remember the difficulty of being drunk, but Jeff did because he was sober. And he would begin the process again. So he would do this every day. Talk to this individual and then talk to me. And, and I would look at him one day and he was really in, in crisis. And I said, you know, and my goal was to try to get him to some outside help. That was my job with him, to try to get him to some outside help. And I looked at him and he said, and the guy, and I said, you know, he doesn't like you talking to me, does he? And he said, no, no. And I realized I was in kind of a precarious situation, so we, we got Jeff to the right people. But I thought, I, that's the most remarkable five years of sobriety I've ever heard of, that this guy managed to stay sober in the face of that kind of psychosis that was occurring in his life. That was his commitment to sobriety. It was absolutely a remarkable thing to me. I can't live like that. I have the option and the opportunity to be relieved of that thinking, to get that, be rid of that, and I've got to do it. Step one clearly is, is this me? Is this me? Do I suffer from an obsession of the mind and analogy of the body? I don't have to get off the couch to do step one. I can read the book, go through this, answer honestly, is this true for me and do I identify with this? The answer is yes, move on. Step one, yeah, I'm powerless over alcohol. I've tried everything. My whole life is unmanageable as a direct result of this one thing in my life. I can attribute all the problems of my life to my drinking and using. All of them. They're all exas either created by or exacerbated by my drinking. So, having established my problem, what's my solution to this problem? What can I do to be relieved of this condition? Step two. Luckily for me, the very, very next step. This is my problem, what's my solution? Step two, could I come to believe that a power greater than myself, something outside of self, could restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of the obsession to drink? Could I come to believe that? Again, sitting on the couch. Yep. Tried everything. Self-knowledge has availed me nothing. Understanding that... I, a guy called me an alcoholic when I was 16 and a half years old. He says, Jesus, you're an alcoholic! And I looked at him like, what's your point? <laughs> of course I am. Working for me, thank you. You, on the other hand, seem quite irascible. Would you like a drink? You seem upset. <laughs> yeah, I knew I was an alcoholic. I did not know what alcoholism was. I didn't know what I was up against. I didn't understand the depths to which I would go. I didn't see the writing on the wall. I knew I was an alcoholic and I was okay with it. So, step two, could I come to uh, the knowledge, the information, my own understanding and awareness never stopped me from drinking. Right? So I came to you basically saying, what does someone like me do? What do I do? Right? We're going to talk about it. Am I going to go to AA meetings and listen to you? And as a result of listening to you, I'm going to feel better? Maybe. Temporarily. Or am I, or is this A&A thing, me constantly coming to you, sitting with you, getting some momentary relief as a result of a meeting? Maybe, maybe not, depending on how the meeting goes. Right? And then I leave to do battle once again, that my respite is in my infrequent um, companionship with you. I'm screwed. I'm screwed. I gotta find something else. It's gonna be, have to be a power greater than me. Some people say the group works for them. Cool. Some people say nature. Excellent. Me personally, God. Me personally. Now I came to AA saying there was no God. No God. I sat laid on a mountain in Mexico in 1974 and watched my family bleed to death right in front of me. Swore I'd never love another human being again as long as I live. There's no way I'm ever going to tell you who I am. There's no way you're going to love me. I'm out. And 
any god that would take a kind, gentle, loving creature like my little sister Kimberly and leave a lying, cheating, thieving, doping alcoholic like me on the planet. I have no use for God of this type. Renounced God. Came into AA, railed, raging against God until my sponsor just got sick of it, Donald. And he loved these moments, by the way. He, he would lie in wait for me. Wait for me to just say one more stupid thing so he could take the the two-by-four and just bash me right between the eyes with it, right? And I was ranting about God, and he just looked over at me and very calmly with a twinkle in his eye, because he's loving this, and says to me, Earl, you can't be mad at a God you don't believe. And I just looked at him and went, I have to go now. (laughs) It just, you know, and there it was. I had a relationship with God. It was just a bad one. I had a bad relationship with God as a direct result of my point of view, my attitude, my insistence upon things being different than they are. Ridiculous. I didn't see that. I wasn't aware of that. It took someone who'd done the work and gone before me to point this out to me and However mildly loving a way, <laughs> he chose to do it. But there I was. There was the truth for me. And that I had to I had to get right with this relationship. What I love about the steps is the steps are about me, God, and you. There's nobody else to play with. But that's it. It addresses me, it addresses God, and it addresses you. And I like the order in which they're placed because it's very clear that i got to get it together over here. i got to get it together over here. It's me, God, and you i got to admit that I'm powerless. i got to seek God as a result of this in step two. I've got to be willing to say, yeah, it's going to take something outside me. Left to my own devices, I'm screwed. I have to surrender this to some force outside of self. The great leap. It's the great leap. It's the great leap right before I have to pull the trigger. Because in step two, could I come to believe in this? Yes. Where am I going to begin this process? The very next step. Right? I'm going to pull the trigger. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to turn my will and my life over to the care of a God I may or may not understand. Huge. Particularly when you think about where we're, a lot of us come from. The pain, the dis-ease, the disconnectedness, the isolation, the loneliness, that, that um, what do they call it, the morass of self-pity. Right? The, 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 the incomprehensible demoralization that we experience that drives me off into what appears to be the abyss. To relinquish control, to let go for really the first time. That whole, that little slogan, let go and let God, right? It's a tidy little statement. It's a cute little quip, right? That used to piss me off. Oh, well, that's lovely. That's lovely. Let go. I'm going to put that right next to turn it over. Thank you. <laughs> love those. Love those little AA slogans. And I love what we do to newcomers with them. You know? The newcomer comes in. He's just stepped out of hell into the back of a meeting. All right? Probably a little edgy. <laughs> you know? A little concerned to have just stepped into a world completely unknown to him. No understanding of what's going on. Nothing. Filled with a a head full of alcoholism. How can it be any other way? Steps into the back of an AA meeting, looking relatively normal. Some of us. Some of us not. And sits down and we walk up and, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Earl alcoholic. Right? Now, I remember when Vegas ran up to me, smiling, and said, Hey, Vegas, alcoholic. I said, So what? Ain't exactly the highlight of my life, Vegas. I don't know what you're so thrilled about. Get away from me. And he looked at me and he said, Keep coming back. And a couple, you know, AA hot chats over here went, Yeah, did you see that? I said, Very good, Vegas. Very good. Keep, keep coming back. Deep, man. Deep, brother. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is good. Loving AA so far. 
Yeah, thank you, Vegas. I'll keep coming back. I'm sure at 3 a.m. this morning when I'm ready to either kill myself or several other people, as I usually am, as I, as I, as I slowly fade into my one hour of sleep a night I'm getting so far, right? I'm sure that keep coming back is going to be very helpful. Thank you. And it's also very clear that there's some deep spiritual significance to keep coming back. I can see that because the friends over here with the whole oh, yeah, deep thing, right? I know you all know what keep coming back does. I don't. You win. I'm the loser. We've all pointed that out at this particular AA meeting. Loving AA so far. If you're, if you're new in here, right, I hope you have more courage than I did. Step up to the plate and ask him, excuse me, do you understand what uh, let go, let God means? Do you understand the deep spiritual significance of this? Because uh, if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Well, if they were in my neighborhood, if they're honest, about 75% of them would say, you know, I don't know what it means either. <laughs> they said it to me when I came in. I'm just saying it to you. I, you know. <laughs> oh, I love that. Signs. It's good. It's like a prompter. Huh? Five minutes till what? Oh. <laughs> All right. I thought, good news. Something big is going to happen in five minutes, guys. Oh, so this is what I'm saying. Step one, what's the problem? Lack of power is my dilemma. I'm powerless over alcohol. My whole life's unmanageable as a, as a result of that one thing. If that's my problem, lack of power, what's my solution? A power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of the obsession to drink so that I can walk the earth a free man. That's the buzz I'm looking for. Step two tells me this is possible. This is up ahead. This is what encourages me to continue. And that's all I've ever needed out of this book, personally. All I've ever needed from any page in this book is not this deep, critical-minded understanding of the nature and the root of the words and how they were connected. I don't think when they reviewed this book or edited it that they thought, said, you know, uh, we better take the word evening off of page 239 because uh, the other words in that sentence are of a Germanic root. And that one is not. I don't think that's what was going on. Were they conveying a sense of what it is I must seek, what it is I must have? If so, I'm compelled to read the next page. That's what's up for me. There has to be an experience that leads me to the next thing. It's almost like, I mean, have you ever read the Zen cone? Have you ever read the little Zen sayings and you read it and you go, you know, blackbird sits on branch in winter. You read that and you go, wow. That was entertaining, right? <laughs> and you go to the next one. But if, you, if you're willing to take the time and you read that same thing twice a day, just read it twice a day. And I think this applies to the book. It's like, it's like it's a masterful Western cone of 164 pages, right? Is if you read it, you know, Blackbird sits on snowbound branch or whatever it is. Now Blackbird sits on snowbound branch. Blackbird sits, yeah, yeah, Blackbird sits, oh, Blackbird. All of a sudden, the childhood memory comes to mind, pop. As you read it, oh, and there's a sense and a feeling that comes as a result of that particular image, the visualization of that image, or the sound that's mentioned, the cracking of the ice or something. And, it's, and something starts to happen to you, and there's an experience, a feeling that comes as a result of that that's comforting or peaceful or, 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 or settling in some way to the self, right? That's what this does. This book does the same thing. It's a book designed to bring about an experience. Right? Self-knowledge availed me nothing. I stood at the turning point. Right? Say, the book tells me. It's not about getting it. It's about getting it. Getting it. Can I have an experience that moves me to the next page? Am I compelled to read on? If so, we're doing great. Break. Thanks. We'll be back. Ten minutes. How could there be? Sure. I don't know. <laughs> Ask it, basket. That's what we need. We have one. No one has any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Amanda.
The question is, who gives a hoot what kind of alcoholic we are? Why should we have to fit into any particular category? Excellent question. Seconded by this woman over here. Yes. And I agree with you. You know, all that stuff is in the beginning, I think, is people could say, oh, well, I identify with that or identify with that a little bit or identify with that. And it just allows you to move on. Um, you know, you'll hear people in meetings say, oh, hi, my name is, you know, Bob. I'm a real alcoholic or, you know, I mean, I, as opposed to the rest of us, you know, <laughs> who thought AA sounded like fun. We just come, <laughs> you know, alcoholic. You know, I agree with you. We never, well, we can't point to anybody else and say, you know, I'm an alcoholic and, well, actually in a meeting I did here one time, it was one of the greatest things I ever saw in an AA meeting. It was at my home group on a Monday night and they asked for anybody that's new to stand and give us your name and the nature of the disease so we can get to know you better at the break, right? And in my meeting we actually do that, right? And this guy gets, anybody new in this can goes up and this guy stands up. My name is Claude, and I'm an alcoholic. And he goes, and so's that guy over there. <laughs> and sits back down, right? <laughs> I thought that was the greatest thing I ever said. You know, he's right. That guy is. I've heard him say it before. <laughs> I love that stuff, right? Yeah. It's just... It's just stuff that you can go, yeah, well, that's me. Carry on. You know, I'm an alcoholic. Who identifies me as an alcoholic is me. Nobody else. You, nobody else. You know, what we identify with, how we come to that, you know, is how we come to that. A lot of us knew it before we got here. It's amazing that for me, because I'm a, I'm a low-bottom, damn near dead drunk when I got here. I mean, there was I got here and went, yep, that's me, yep, that's me, yep, that's me, yep, that's You know what I mean? There's no question. What I, it's amazing to me because it's outside my own experience, but I see it happen, are the ones that come to A that aren't convinced, have somehow gotten here not yet convinced that this is where they need to be. It must have something to do with the amount of education that's gone on in, the, in our communities over the last 25 years, that they find their way in here. You know, they got the nudge from the judge, you know what I mean, or a family member's forced them in, or, you know, they're, they're here under threat of some terrible event, you know. And they go through this process and discover that they are. You know, I just it's just amazing to me to watch that happen. I love watching that happen. It happened to a guy I'm sponsoring right now. Um, let's see, he's got to have about 57 days now. Yeah, 57 days. He's very funny, too. We were at a meeting. He had, the last meeting I was at with him, he had 51 days. And there was a guy who'd shared right before him who had uh, 41 days. So he had 10 days more than this guy. So the guy's sharing about, you know his plight as a recovering alcoholic at 41 days, right? And the guy's going through a lot. And my guy raises his hand, you know, Dave, alcoholic, and he looks at the other guy and he goes, and I got 51 days, and brother, I got to tell you, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last week, you were there. <laughs> oh, God, we're classic, aren't we? So, did I help with the question? Thank you. We all right over here? All right, yeah. Any more questions? We've covered so much already. All right. Step three. Made a decision. Right? Turn my will and my life over to the care of God. I mean, to keep this one simple, for me, some people have apparently have no problem with this step. They come in with a, with a, a significant spiritual life in place. It's, it's odd that the, the normie thinks, how can you be an alcoholic and have a uh, have a, uh, a, a a spiritual life at the same time? Easy. Um, you have a profound faith in God and you drink uncontrollably. And so that's how you do that. <laughs> that's how that happens. But the third step for me um, was very scary. This was a very scary step because I knew going into this process that my life was on the line. I knew that I was in the last house on the block. I knew that if this didn't work for me, I was a dead man. I knew that there wasn't another there wasn't another game that I was going to get in that was going to help me with this. This was going to have to work or I was screwed. Because I was so angry at God when I got here, 
What the third step meant to me was, was I going to become willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of a God I was incredibly angry at? Was I willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of a God I saw as an unjust and unforgiving God? Was I willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of a God I may or may not understand? I may or may not believe in. That this is all up for grabs. This unseen, unknown, untouchable presence. This, this um, um, experience where I had yet to meet the individual who could tell me about the face of God. I didn't, this was a really an alarming leap into the abyss, if you will, for somebody like me. The beauty of this thing, though, is, is that on the one side, I had my experience of 16 years of chronic alcoholism and drug abuse. And on this end, I had a bad relationship. I jumped. I pulled the trigger. I got down on my knees and to the best of my ability turned my will and my life over to the care of a God I did not understand. That was the best I could do. The best I could do is I don't understand. If this God thing, if this is what I must seek to relieve me of these problems, how can this be the same God that I've had these other, right? There was so much self. There was so much self inflicted upon this relationship. There was so much willful behavior inflicted upon this relationship. There was so much dogma that was in my head that I was inflicting this relationship with that I couldn't see it for what it was. It was so befuddled and enmeshed. I couldn't just let it be what it was. So I did this. I turned my will and my life over the care by getting on my knees and saying the third step prayer and getting back up. And how that felt was, and I felt it was spooky. Right? I mean, what I basically felt was is that my life is on the line. I just took two a pair of dice, and I don't even know what the game is we're playing. And I threw them out on the board, having no idea what to expect. That was the leap of faith. Right? In spite of my own experiences, I must go this way. In spite of my own crippled belief system, I must go this way. Those who have what I want are saying go this way. See, that's the amazing thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is I'm sitting around in meetings and there's guys like the late Fred Ellis, right, in these meetings. And this man would talk and I believed everything that man said. If I stood next to him, if I felt like I'd taken 20 milligrams of Valium, I just, mm, nice. <laughs> Fred makes me feel good. Now, I was too afraid to talk to Fred, right? So at the at Thursday night beginner's workshop in Brentwood, California, Fred was always there. At the end of the meeting, Fred would stand up, like right over here by the podium, and guys would come up and talk to Fred. Guys he sponsored would check in with him and ask questions, and Fred would share his experience, strength, and hope with him. And I would stand behind Fred and burglarize their conversation, right? Just I did this for many, many weeks. And then one day, Fred was talking to these guys, and all of a sudden, Fred turned around and went, Hi, Earl, how are you? Stuck out his hand, and I went, huh? I'm Paralyzed. My God, <laughs> he knows my name, you know? Which was entirely too close a relationship for me in early sobriety. <laughs> right? And there he was. And Hi, I, hi. Hi. Got to go now. You know, run home. Pace. Fred knows my name. <laughs> ah. So I did the step. It felt like, you know when you get on the roller coaster and you're going up the thing and it's going click, 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 click. The third step is where you feel the, you hear the click and stop. It's like, well, buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. You're on the ride now, pal. And that's how it felt to me. It felt to me because as soon as I did it, it felt a little spooky. It felt like, wow, man, I really did that. I did that as well as I could do it at that time. And I got back in my seat and the book, and basically the book says at that point, we were hoping you're serious about what you just did. It's like, oh, God, now you tell me. <laughs> Couldn't you have said, you better be serious before you do this, right? That would have... I could have hovered right there at the brink of three for several years, having heard that. But he said, we hope you were serious about what you did, because 
See, now we have to embark upon a plan of rigorous action, right? Or this is all just a conversation, right? A lot of guys sitting around in the bars, you know, going, you know, that third step is a bitch. <laughs> Anybody in here ever heard of a guy named Mike Ross? It's apparent I need to tell you about Mike Ross. Now, one hand went up. Mike Ross was bigger than life in every respect. Big man. I think when I got sober, Fred, uh, uh, Mike must have had, I don't know, you know, like, like 1100 years of sobriety. He'd been sober forever. He was this old guy, gruff, gruff man. And we used to love the guy. My, my friend Christopher and I, we would go to this one meeting where Mike always went. And if you didn't, if you didn't have 10 years, he wouldn't even talk to you. You know what I mean? Because he figured you could die at any moment. There's no point in investing any time in you. I mean, just this hard-edged guy, right? But what we loved, we didn't care. You know what I mean? What we loved about the guy was what he shared in meetings and the way he would say goodnight. Because, I mean, every every time you'd, you'd see Mike and he'd be walking off towards the door to to, uh, to leave and we'd have we'd be behind him and we'd go, Good night, Mike! And Mike would think that a friend of his was calling out to him and Mike would turn around to say goodbye to a friend go, <laughs> He'd just dismiss us. You're not even worth saying good night to. You know, we only had like eight years, you know. <laughs> guy was hysterical, but he saved my life more than one time. We would be sitting in a step study. I remember going to this one step study, brand new, and I mean, my head's on fire. I'm in flames. Just nobody can see it. You know what I mean? I'm walking in a meeting, and I'm going to see him, going to see him, going to sit him, we're going to talk about the step, we're going to talk about the step. Okay, good, 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 good. Apparently the steps are a big thing. We'll talk about step. Four step. Ah, four step. Haven't done that yet. Let's hear all about it. It's great, 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 great. I just, you know, sit in a meeting, I'm like out of my mind, but you know, people are walking up and going, how you doing? I'm fine. How you doing? I'm fine. My newcomer mantra, you know, how you doing? Fine. Fine. You know, in, in my head, you're th I'm thinking things like, you're not being attacked. You're not being attacked. He just said hello. You're not being attacked. Mayday, mayday. Person coming at me. You know. Dicey in my head. And I'm sitting down and a guy shares about the four step, talks about the four step. Great length, great detail, minutia, just, I mean, just, God, could there be any more about this step? It's brilliant. I remember thinking, got to get the guy's number. Fabulous. Fabulous. Broke the step down. What more could I need to know? Next guy raises his hand. Goes on for five minutes about the four steps. Just fabulous. It's just unbelievable. Couldn't be less like what the last guy talked about, but delightful. Very entertaining. Great stuff. Thinking, okay, all right, we got two, we got two ways to do this now. If I have the fifth guy, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I don't need to buy a new gun because I'm only going to use it once. <laughs> I'm ready. This is it. I can't do this. And all of a sudden in the back, a big mitt goes up in the air. And the guy calls me here, Mike Alcoholic. <laughs> here comes Mike Ross, right? And he goes like this. And I go, jeez, maybe he knows an old guy. You know what I mean? I turn around and I see this go up. It goes like this. I got to ask, has anybody in here read this? <laughs> <laughs> and I just went, thank God for this guy, right? And he just basically says, when you do your fourth step is when you're done with the third. I got that. That sounds good to me. He made it very clear. When, when should I do my fourth step? If you, did you do the third? Yep. Get on it. Make a list. Make a list. Oh, okay, okay. The guy just had a way of... It's just... Don't want to go round and round and round. Want to move. Want to move. Want to carry through this process. Because here's the thing about this whole thing. You are not going to get this right, according to Mike, in your first pass. This isn't about getting it right. This is about getting it, doing it, having an experience as a result of the process. The cool part about the steps is, you know, you're not it's like, okay, does everyone in here recognize that uh, you're allowed to do the steps once? We don't allow you to do it any more than one time. So you better get it right the first time. If you don't, you're screwed. You know, you will be relegated to the half measures room. 
and there you must stay until one day, mercifully, you just drink. Now, if I do the steps to the best of my ability, I'm, ha I'm doing something. I'm taking an action. As a result of the action, an experience comes. As a result of the experience, I change. So then when I come back to step one, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. It's a new step, right? I remember going into a meeting. I was 11 years sober, and there's a guy. I was meeting this woman at this meeting, and, we, and I go in there. I'm not going to a meeting. I'm going to meet her, right? And I slide in, and the, right before the meeting starts, and there's one seat. She's got a seat for me in the front row. Oh, good. All right. Now, the front row is six feet from the speaker because it's just a table, you know, a fold-down table, and there's the leader and the speaker sitting there. And this guy, Jack, is going to talk on step one for 20 minutes. Oh, Christ. You know, and I'm in the front row, and I can't just go, can't hang with you, Jack, and run out the door. You know what I mean? I'm stuck. I'm going to have to sit and listen. Now I've got 11 years sobriety at this time, right? You can't tell me a thing about step one. I have done step one. Done, put it to bed, case closed, 100% done, step one. You're not gonna, I don't want, this is, this is hell. I'm in hell. I gotta listen to this guy go on about step one. Well, it turns out the guy was Jack Prose, who had 43 years of sobriety at the time. He talked for 20 minutes on step one and blew the top of my head off. He was talking about concepts and ideas and a level of awareness that had never even occurred to me before. Just talking about the steps, just kind of tripping on where he was at with it, right? And when the meeting was over, I looked at my friend and said, she said, well, what step are you on? I went, well, one. Apparently, I'm on step one. And the cool thing about AA is, is that, that if you hang around here and actually pay attention, that's going to happen all the time. All the time. I thought I had, was very cool with God till a woman, I was about 16 years sober, and a woman with two and a half years got up at the podium, started to talk about her relationship with God. Blew my mind. It was great. That's what goes on around here. Different people coming at it from different perspectives and different directions. So if you're thinking about doing this, if you do the book, you come up to me at the end of this and go, delightful, all very entertaining, however, uh, I do it a completely different way. <laughs> okay. That's my response. Okay, good. That means more dialogue. I, what I love is people who get up here. And, people, occasionally we'll, we'll do this sort of stuff and somebody will come up to me and go, Earl, I find your comments on uh, the process of recovery disturbing. Hey, <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're killing alcoholics, Earl. For Christ's sake, you gotta, you need to do it this way. Here's my workbook that I've developed over the last eight months. <laughs> and I'd like you to take this workbook and, and explore what I've seen as the relationship between God, self, and others. I say, okay, cool. And, and Earl, please, for God's sakes, just, you know, don't talk in AA anymore until you, until you, until you've read my book. Say, oh, all right, then thanks for sharing that with me. That's lovely. Well, and, and I love how pissed off people get about this stuff. It's hysterical to me. I'm standing, I'm standing in a room with a bunch of dead people sitting up pretending they're paying attention to me. Right? We're alcoholics and drug addicts and we're arguing over how to develop a relationship with God. It's like, I can't, I can't get too upset about this, all right? It's just, it's crazy, right? What we're doing, we're wrestling with the concept of God here, right, in this third step. I wrestle with the concept. That's, that's what Israel, Israel means one who wrestles with God, right? I'm not, it does, the book, it says to me in the portion of chapter 5 that I've heard God knows how many times in 22 years. I, God couldn't what if he were sought. It doesn't say God couldn't what if he were found. God couldn't it would if he were sought. Then I must seek God. I'm given very, very specific instructions on how to go about doing that later on in the step. I must seek God. But what I've got to do at first is throw myself at it, to open up my arms and say, I let go, I let God. I surrender. I can't, God can, I'll let him. God could. Restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of the obsession of drink. Now and what, what what's interesting is is that these actions the action of these steps where I seek this God, um, is remarkable to me. That, that it's about my willingness to get the stuff that I place between me and God and me and my fellows out of the way. I put it there, I get rid of it. I don't ask God to get rid of it, I do it. I don't ask you to do it, I do it. 
I do it. I don't stand, sit in my apartment and wait for life to come knock on the door. I must get up and go outside. I had a sponsor, my second sponsor after Donald died. I had a second sponsor for six years. He's a great friend of mine. I love him dearly, Al S. He's the guy that get between those, right? He's a big meditation guy. It's very difficult to talk to because he's just being there while you're, <laughs> while you're talking to him. He's a fantastic example. So you don't, he's a sponsor. You don't do what he says. You just watch him and feel him. You know what I mean? Just right there. He's just, he's an amazing human being. Absolutely amazing. But he said, you know, Earl, if you give your life to God and sit in the closet, what you get is coat hangers. Right? It took me six months to wrap my head around that. It's like, all right, I'll, I'll be back when I have any idea what that means. You know? Donald used to say to me, Earl, oh, God comes in shoe leather. Okay. Apparently God is a shoe salesman. I don't... So I get it, right? There's these actions I take to open myself up to this experience of a power greater than myself. I can assure you I do not understand God. I pray to a God I don't understand. But I do pray to a God that I see the evidence of in my life on a daily basis. On a daily basis. You know, it's there if I want it. That's, that's a lot of what the big buzz is for me. Are these sudden realizations that if I just stand still and feel the life that is around me, that there's something quite remarkable going on all the time. That's the cool thing, man. It's better than any drug I ever took. I took so much LSD that I was classified legally insane by the military. Right? And this buzz is better. You know? This buzz is better. You know? I've done enough heroin in one night, sit around, you know, just checking my pulse. Just... Yeah, yeah there it goes again. Good. <laughs> I've slowed it way down. I've drank enough alcohol to come to in different cities. Right? No buzz better than that the clarity of being completely present in a moment and feeling the presence of God. That's an amazing, an amazing, amazing event. And this is the only way that that's available. How I begin that process is by being willing to turn my will and life over the care of God as I understand him or don't understand him to get out on my knees and say the third step prayer if you ha and i mean literally get down on my knees not figuratively speaking for me literally i literally get down on my knees and say that prayer the reason i do that is it's i, I gotta humble myself humility is the willingness to learn for me and i i have to present myself willingly and that way i know for a fact there's no mistaking i can't say well i feel willing as i stand there with my chest out but if i'm willing to get down on my knees and just do it from a position i'm not being submissive i'm relinquishing power i'm relinquishing control come on i'm here i'm willing if i ask god will come what the book says i have to ask i gotta ask right? so i do so that's step three for me nice and simple easy it's about the experience of it it's about gathering an experience it's about creating an opportunity for a deeper and more meaningful experience that's what it is step four i just pulled the trigger in step three boom i'm in the ride stop clicking here we go right it says i must immediately i get up from step three and i embark upon a plan of action immediately what's the action plan for me Four through nine. Four through nine. Four and five is me. Six and seven is God. Eight and nine is you. Nobody else to play with. That's everybody. We're all covered. What do I do in four? Well, according to this, according to this, I do a resentment inventory, a fear inventory, and a sex inventory. Why do I do it on those three things? Because if you want to see where I can leave the playing field those are three pretty good areas to take a look at <laughs> we're going to see a pattern develop here that 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 a blind man could see all right then that's why i do it and i just do it out of the book i do a resentment inventory right i do it in four columns there are those that'll tell you it's three columns there are those that'll tell you you need there's four columns but three of the columns are broken down into four specific areas there are others that will tell you that there are two columns that are broken down into one into three areas and one into two. 
There's others that will say, we do it in black and white, so when you do your fourth column, we suggest you use these four things and write a sentence detailing specifically how those things have come into being. To all of this, I say, okay. <laughs> sure. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever you can look at and go, well, you know, that makes sense to me. I can see that. Great. Then dive into that. Just do it. Just do it. First inventory I did, I went to my sponsor, who was not a big book guy. Donald wasn't a big book guy. He used to rant and rave at us. He called us little book thumpers. The little book thumpers. He goes, before there was a book, there was one alcoholic down in the dirt sharing his experience, strength, and hope with another alcoholic. <laughs> well, that's true. We're going back to the book now. <laughs> And you would get into the book. And in my first inventory, I said, what do you want me to do? He said, get rid of the garbage. So I wrote 27 pages of garbage and told him about it. And I got my first direction from my sponsor in A. My first direction was, we don't kill people here one day at a time. <laughs> Which I thought was very reasonable, doable, one just one day at a time, just today. And, uh, um, and I haven't killed anybody one day at a time. I was actually planning a murder when I came to AA. So he felt compelled to tell me immediately, but we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. My best thinking again. So I do a resentment inventory. I make a list of, and it, it talks about it in the book. I mean, if you guys want me to, I can waste a lot of time up here, put my glasses on and read it to you. Exactly what it says and why you do it that way. But I'm figuring these are readily available. <laughs> you know? These are readily available. You want to see precisely how it is in here? Go here and look, read it. What I'm telling you is what I did was I went, went here. And when I finally did an inventory that was out of this book, that's when things changed for me. The getting rid of the garbage was great. It made it possible for me to take action that suggested I was making a commitment to being here. That was a value. Doing it completely different than the book told me to do it was a value. Absolutely a value. I think what that did was it allowed me to then feel like I'd earned the seat I was sitting in. In AA that I was an active member. I wrote, written 27 pages of this stuff, and, right, down on paper. I was doing something in support of my own life, in support of my own recovery. I wasn't acknowledging that this was my problem. I wasn't acknowledging that this was my solution. I wasn't quietly slipping off the couch to my knees saying the third step prayer and popping back up. I was actually at the direction of another human being, my sponsor, writing down all my secrets, all the stuff I was going to my grave with. It was really, really valuable. Did it change my life? Yeah. Did doing out of the book have a more profound effect on my life than that? Yeah. Much more so. Much more so because I was able in this inventory out of the book to see the pattern of behavior in my life. When I looked at my inventory, when I looked at my side of the street, when I looked at how resentment, fear, my sexual behavior was isolating me in the world. When, when you looked at my whole inventory, I saw one word, powerlessness. A powerlessness to be effective in the world. Powerlessness in terms of my own individual well-being. Powerlessness in terms of my relationships with other people. That I was in fact a self-centered, frightened man and that this was ruling my life. In my sexual relationships, I was either completely in control or totally unavailable. Right? Never in the middle. Never an equal participant. Unable. Completely unable to do that. My relationship with God, I already told you about that. That wasn't doing so well. Relationship with self, filled with self-loathing. All of my relationships were just in the trash can. This was a painful experience. I listed my resentments. I listed the individuals that I resented. I listed the institutions that I resented. I listed the principles that I had great objection to. You know, loving and being loved, being on time, being accountable for my actions. <laughs> 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 
hated all that stuff. And when I did my, when I got to this enough, I realized I just got out my address book. <laughs> because it basically got down to, because the question I ask myself when doing an inventory is, how free do you want to be? How free do you want to be? When that thing goes by and you go, well, ah, not really, right? Ah, well, if it floated by, write it down. We can discuss it later, whether or not it's pertinent, right? And people always ask me, Earl, can you have a resentment in your life that you have no part in? And my answer to that is, probably. There weren't any in mine. But I have actually sponsored a couple of guys that had some things listed, and there, and it was, there was, they had no part in it. Right? They had no part in it. There are circumstances that can occur in life that can cause you great deep-seated resentment that you have no part in. Yeah, I've actually seen it, and I'll be happy to discuss with anybody at one of these breaks that we have along the way. For you smokers, of which I am now a proud non-member of that group. Yeah. <laughs> the smokers. <laughs> Well, now, here's the smokers. <laughs> anyway. So you do the inventory, right? I list my, my resentments. I resent my father. Call him two. Why do I resent him? What's my specific resentment against my father? Well, I got 54 resentments against my father. Right? 54. List them. 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, or 1-1, 1-2, 1-3, 1-4, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 
Fear, fear of flying. Why? Because that crashed. Right? It's not a, not a, 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 a um, what do they call it when it's just, it's not a phobia. Thank you. He gets an extra bagel. <laughs> it's not a phobia. It's based on my experience. Right? That I'm afraid of flying. Right? Well, why am I afraid of crash? And then move through your inventory. Move through. Basically, what I've discovered is I'm afraid of two things. I'm afraid of rejection and I'm afraid of, of abandonment. That's what I'm afraid of. Pretty much every fear I've got you can put under one category or the other. Right? So in the 12 and 12, in the seventh step, right, second to last page, it says, self-centered fear is the chief activator of all my defects of character. Either I'm not going to get something I want or I'm going to lose something I already have. Rejection and abandonment. And it gets real, real simple. So that when I'm functioning in my life, I, I don't have this blanket, vague, un, 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 uh, unexamined wall of fear that I can throw up in the world. You know what I mean? So when you walk up to me and suddenly you're confronting me, oh, I hate your discussion about step three. <gasps> wall of fear. Now lob things over the wall until this person goes away. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't like your clothes. I don't like your discussion on step four. I hate you. I don't like you either. Screw you. <laughs> Lobbing stuff. Like Make him go away. He's scaring me. <laughs> then the person goes away. But if I recognize all I'm afraid of is, is, is fear, I have a fear of not getting what I want or losing to my hand, I'm afraid of two things, right? So you come up and you scare me, and I throw up my wall of fear, and I just go, huh? Oh, that didn't work. i got to take a deep breath and go, what am I afraid of here? I'm afraid I'm not going to get something I want to be accepted by you, or I'm going to lose something I already have. A reason for being here. Or just fill in your own blank, whatever it may be. What works for you, right? It's, and it's just silly. And then so then you say, you know, I don't like your thing on step three. And I go, well, you know what? Let me take you back to the room back there. There's a whole bunch of tapes and stuff of other guys back there, some of whom I think are really good at talking about the book. Maybe one of them has got a way of breaking down step three or step four that you like. May I suggest Joe and Charlie? Right? It's got nothing to do with me. You don't like it? I'm, I'm okay. Fine. I personally delight in the way I do this. <laughs> Find your own way. Find your own way. This is just one little glimpse of it. I don't have this thing wrapped up. I'll come back here next year, sit down and go, remember that last time I was out here? You got a tape of that last one? Burn it. We got a whole new way of doing it. What would that mean? Would that mean that I was wrong today? No. No. Would mean that I've continued to explore the process. I have another way of communicating it. I have a different experience of it now, which requires yet another way of communicating it. So you just find your way through. Some of you are going to become big Joe and Charlie fans. Those are going to be your guys. So that guy and that guy and that guy? Crap! <laughs> then you're going to become a Joe H. guy. The rest of us are peasants. Find your own way. It's all good. Because what you are, if you're prescribing to a particular path is, is you're saying, I'm an alcoholic and I seek this thing. I seek this process. I seek this unfolding in my own life. And that's what it's about. So that's all we're doing here today is wrestling with it this way today. All right? So I do these four column inventories on resentment, fear, and sex. Right? Now, in step five, I'm supposed to reveal these before God to another human being. I'm supposed to sit down with somebody and get it out. I would suggest doing that. <laughs> really, it's not that deep. Do you know what I mean? What you have to do, the specific way you go about it. The book will suggest, the 12 and 12 will suggest, it will, the book will suggest, this is how you go about it, right? You sit down with somebody, the, the 12 and 12, Bill talks about all kinds of stuff in, in the fourth step. He talks about, only thing in the 12 and 12 I disagree on, this is just me, I actually disagree with something he says. He says, well, if you got a bunch of really, really heavy stuff that you're reading most of it to your sponsor and then you go to another person, there's one paragraph, and talk about at the rest of it with somebody else. I don't go for that personally. I'm, I was so good at compartmentalizing my life when I was out there. That was one of my major problems was that nobody knew the whole story. 
This guy knows a little bit. She knows a little bit. That guy knows a little bit. She knows a little bit. But nobody knows her all really. Nobody knows the whole deal. And there's pieces in each of those compartments that say an awful lot about who I am. So I had to find me. That's just me. I had to find a place where I could give it all up. All of it in one place. So that's what I did before God to another human being. And I sat down, and I laid out my four columns in resentment inventory, and I did it in columns, right? And I read it in rows, right? I wrote my resentment list until it was done, then I went to column two and answered the stuff in column two. When that was done, I went to column three. When I read it to the individual that I read it to, I read it across in the rows. One, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, till one was done, then I went to two. And I read across. And that way, and that was how it, it became a completely different document. Doing it that way. Instead of just this way, all of a sudden I'm doing it in another way. And this incredible pattern of behavior in my life is revealed to me. Right? When I saw, so that was the fifth step. I sat down and I did it. Was I happy about this? No. Was it a comfortable experience for me? Absolutely not. Did I have a lot of discussion with my sponsor as I was reading it to him? No. Anything that was said in that meeting, other than what I had written down, was conversation that he introduced. My job was to show up and read what I had written, not offer further explanation, not get, read what was written, not, not an occasional preemptive strike where I would sit and go, now this next one. Let me discuss this next one with you. Hold on. I want to restate that I was not in my right mind, <laughs> that I personally do not consider this to be an example of who I am. None of that. He just shut up and read it. And I read it. Occasionally he would say, time out. <laughs> right? Read that last one again. I loved that one. And he would, <laughs> he would do that to me. Or he would do the wonderful, loving, sponsor type thing where he would say, that reminds me of a story. Because he'd see that I'd read one that I was particularly ashamed of. And he would say, that reminds me of a story. And he'd tell some atrocious story about something he'd done that was very, very similar to this hideous event in my life, right? And it, re it relieved me. I mean, there was healing that went on as the process took place because of who he was. I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing experience. Did I feel, and at the end of the step, fifth step, I felt different. What I felt was remarkably exposed, that's what I felt. And it was remarkably uncomfortable. But it was the only way I was going to discover for myself that I could tell you the truth about who I was and you wouldn't throw me away. That you would just consider me more as one of yours as with you than before. All right? That was it for me. And that was the only way a guy like me was I, believing you that because you told me some. No, nah. not like I got it when I did it. When I did it, I was in. I was in. I showed up, and I looked at my sponsor when I was done with my fifth step, and I said to him, now all I have to do is wait for you to die. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, oh, isn't that lovely? And he walked away. Um, Amazing experience. An amazing experience. Let's take a break. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're just glad it's almost lunch. Yeah. Um, okay, where the hell are we? What, what, what am I talking about? Five? Five. We were talking about five, weren't we? Yeah? Talk about six? Okay. You're going to hate me for this. It's, I love this part. <laughs> you 
You say that as if you know what I'm looking for. <laughs> and you were correct. I love the guys. There's a guy I know that does the thing. I mean, he knows where everything is on what page, blah, 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 blah. He'll see, he talks and he says, in the bottom of page 83, top of 84, it says, right? He does that through his whole talk, and everybody's sitting there, they're going, they're all laughing like, he's just making this up, right? Then you go back to the book and you go, oh, my God. He's nailing it every time. He's got it, like, memorized. I'm one of those guys that believes in libraries. I believe in books. Information's in here. I don't keep it in my head. Where is it? Well, it's in here. You can find it. Which might, reminds me, it says something on the page, on page uh, uh, 25. Don't shout it out if you know. We love the suspense. That I wanted to say because there was something somebody said to me during the break that made me think of it. And I figured, what the hell? I get the backtrack if I want. It says, there is a solution. Right there. Almost none of us likes the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Uh, I don't know about you. That's pretty good news to me, because I've been living in a state of what I considered to be unparalleled madness and pain. So to discover that the tough part's going to be self-searching, leveling of pride, and confession of shortcomings, I'm in. Do I like those things? No. Am I willing to do those in an effort to get my... I was about to say to get my life back, but to get a life? I'm in. I'll do them. Tell me how to do them. Luckily, that's exactly what this, this step stuff is all about, right? Is doing this stuff. Remember... The whole idea here is to be restored to sanity, soundness of mind, to be relieved of the obsession to drink and use, to be free of the beast, to have that voice stop whispering in my ear. That's the whole point. So, right, so I'm doing this to bring about an experience. If I've done the fourth step, to the best of my ability, which I have done on more than one occasion. Some people do one a year. To this I say, they're of it. Some people say they do one and that's it. To these people I say, wonderful. There are other people that say, I do spot inventories monthly. Fantastic. I don't go more than five years without doing an inventory. That's me. To this I say, good for you, Earl. <laughs> do I advise that you do the same? Nope. Do I advise that you... Sit quietly, doing things that we suggest later in the steps so that you can do a, a proper assessment of where you're at. If you discover that you have once again in sobriety become restless, irritable, and discontented on a consistent basis, if you find that you are no longer reveling in the life that you live, if you find yourself out of sorts, I might suggest that you reinvest in the path. And a great way to do that is to engage in the action plan set forth before us. That action plan begin. Step one, what's the problem? Lack of power. Step two, what's the solution? A power. Step three, make a decision to do something about this. Third step, prayer. Begin the action plan that brings this solution about in my life. Four and five, me. Six and seven, God. Eight and nine, you. Me first. Got to clear away the stuff that I put between me and you and me and God because you guys are coming up in 6 and 7 and 8 and 9. I'm going to be engaging you all. I've got to get this stuff out of the way so that that becomes possible for me. I put it there. I get it out of the way. Now, people can say, and newcomers will say to me, 
But you know, these resentments are well-founded. I, I, I beg to differ, Earl. I do not put this stuff in the way. People have go- done me great harm. Just the other day, I was just horribly insulted. Well, really, what happened? Well, I was making the coffee at the meeting, and a guy walked up to me and said, Your coffee sucks. I consider this a heinous act, girl. <laughs> and my resentment is well-founded. I say, great. Now, here's what I want you to do. Now, what, are you going to just say it again? Yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm just going to say it again. Just do this and see what happens. See what happens. The discovery comes as a result of the action, of doing it. Right? So, my feeling about stuff like this, this one always gets me in trouble. If what you do is you come listen to as Earl sees it, right? Dangerous at best. To then go out there and figure, well, you know, I'm doing the steps. Because I sat there and I listened to him. You're in trouble. Don't do that. Don't, no. Actually get one of these. One of the best kept secrets in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> the big book. Read it and do what it suggests. Do it. If you don't do it, you ain't going to get it like you could. So you understand what I mean? That's about watching golf on TV and then turning off the television and saying, I'm an excellent golfer. <laughs> no, you're not. You have not experienced the horrifying moment when the perfectly struck four iron duck hooks. <laughs> right? You can't watch people surfing and go, I understand. No, you don't. When you go out there and try to catch 50 waves in a row and catch none of them, and then the one that you do catch shoves you to the bottom of the sea and back up again, and you come to the surface with sand and salt water exploding from every orifice of your body, right? When you go through all that and then suddenly the day comes where it all clicks and you catch the wave and you stand on the board and you slide down the face of a wave and you shoot, you do a bottom turn, goofy foot into the wave, right? And suddenly you realize, you know, I'm not in the way here. I'm a part of this. I'm not interfering with the process of this wave at all. I'm riding with the wave. I am do, I'm in a very natural experience. I'm in a rhythm that is of nature, not my own. I have found my way into that. And I'm getting a real buzz out of riding this wave, right? Now you know about surfing. Skydiving? I assure you that I know nothing about skydiving. (laughs) And I can also assure you that I never will. (laughs) Jumping out of a perfectly good plane is lunacy. (laughs) But you don't know until you do it, right? So when people come to you with problems in AA and you have no experience in those problems, say so. And give them the numbers to the people that do. I spawned, was sponsoring a guy who came to me and he had his, he had a great problem. He was suffering and he had a sexual identity crisis going on. And he came to me and he said, Earl, I have a tremendous sexual identity crisis going on. And I said, bummer. Now here's a friend of mine, call him and talk to him immediately because He also suffered from a sexual identity crisis, and he has resolved that to his own great satisfaction. Maybe he can help you with his experience in that. I don't have any. I mean, if somebody came to me and said, Earl, I struggle with being tall, i got to give you a number. (laughs) Short guy back there laughing his ass off. (laughs) <laughs> it's not, you know, what do I know? Right? However, I did have a guy, conversely, this is also true. I had a guy I was sponsoring call me up and say, we got to have lunch. Okay. I do that daily. We'll have lunch. 
So we go and we have lunch. And he goes, Earl, I got to get another sponsor. You know, because I'm, I'm, I'm married now. I go, I know I was the best man at your wedding. <laughs> he says, I'm married now and, and you're single. And, you know, I think I need a married sponsor. So I, I, I'm getting a, I'm going to get a married sponsor. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not upset by that. However, however, I would, you know, just as a passing thought, you know, you're also French. And I would suggest that you get a uh, married French sponsor. <laughs> You're also quite tall, so clearly a tall French sp uh, married sponsor. You know, and, and I live on the west side and you live in the valley, so I would suggest a tall married French sponsor that lives in the valley. And he was pissed off enough at this point to pick up the check and take off. <laughs> so what? This isn't about that stuff. This isn't about the facts of our lives. I remember that there was a meeting in L.A. that started. It was a cocaine anonymous meeting for cocaine addicted Jewish attorneys. <laughs> I was told of this when I was done laughing. He said, what do you think of that? And I said, fine. You know, my experience says it ain't going to be there very long. And it's it lasted, I think, like six weeks. And then that meeting dissolved. Common problem, common solution. Our common problem is not that we are Jewish, or that we are gay or straight, or tall or short, or where we live. Our common solution, our common problem is, is that we are alcoholic. Period. And our common solution is this process. So, that brings me to page 76, where it says, and it speaks at great length, great length, in a very, very detailed manner, precisely how to do step six and seven. It says, if we can answer to our, if we can answer to our satisfaction, our these questions concerning step five and prior to that. We then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us to be but willing. When ready, we say something like this. Didn't say precisely like this, said something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. We have now then completed step seven. Any questions? I have an opinion here. Make, if you're taking notes, note that. Opinion number 47, Earl. Very short section on 6 and 7. And notice, 1 through 5, we covered 75 pages plus doctor's opinion, forwards, all kinds of stuff, right? Circles, triangles, a lot going on up there, right? We get to six and seven, zip, zip. we go to eight and nine, tremendous amount of conversation about eight and nine, and rightly so, because they're actually going to, if you'll notice, they're actually going to let us out of the house for the first time. <laughs> right? One and two on the couch. Three, kneel down, get back up on the couch. Four, right? Five, guy comes in, before God I read this to him, he says, good luck, he leaves. <laughs> six and seven, two paragraphs. Getting ready to leave the house. I'm either, I'm, can they know how much, how dangerous I can be armed with a little bit of information? So they're very, very cautious about how they let me out of the house. Right? It's a very, very short thing. And the reason I think is this. We're talking about a relationship with the unknowable. The one whose name cannot be spoken. The face no man has seen. Right? We're talking about infinity. I've taken lots of, lots of drugs. I've tried to wrap my head around infinity and it just doesn't seem to get there. I get as far as I can go, spook myself, oh, back in the room. 
That was close, you know? <laughs> it's unknowable, right? I'm going to embrace something on a significantly different level than any other relationship I'm ever going to have. And in my opinion, again, num this opinion number 48, my opinion, the most powerful and influential relationship of my life, a relationship with a power greater than myself, God, for me. I should... And it says, my creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. Taking my judgment out of it. That's taking me out of the loop. Here it is, all of me. The things that I consider good based on my belief system, my moral psychology, the things that I consider bad, all of it. Good, bad, look at it any way you want. Here it is, here I am, take it. All right? I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. It does not say, please remove this stuff from me, God, so that I can uh, be one hell of a guy. <laughs> so that I can walk the earth with people, as I walk by, people saying, why, that's Earl Hightower. Charming, charming man. <laughs> Delightful fellow. He does a lot of good, doesn't he? <laughs> please. My usefulness to you and my fellows that I can be of service in my life. This isn't about glorification of self. This is about getting out of your own way so that you can be a maximum service to God and your fellows. That's the whole idea. That's where the buzz is. I'm, I don't get off on me anymore. But I can. I, it's, a, it's an amazing experience to sponsor some guy and play some infinitesimal small part of being a catalyst maybe to get him to do something that pushes him closer to God and to you so that he has the experience of God and he has the experience of you and the light comes back on in his lives and he lit in his eyes and he lives instead of dies. Wow! I never stuck anything in my arm that caught me a buzz like that. Nothing. I remember sitting in a meeting. I always cry when I tell this story. Why do I tell it? I know I'm going to embarrass myself going in. Why do I go in? Apparently it must be told. So, I'm in a workshop, and we're doing this workshop, and there's a woman in this workshop, and her name is Kathy. I had watched Kathy wrestle with the obsession to drink and use for nine years. And she finally became willing to go to this book study. She was really one of the reasons I agreed to even do it. So we got about 25 people and we're going through the book. And the format is we read two paragraphs and we stop. If anybody's got any questions regarding these two paragraphs, we mix it up. If anybody's got any experience with them, they share that experience and we mix it up. And when we're, everybody's done with whatever they need to say or whatever questions they need to ask, then we move on. And we have no time frame. We're in no hurry. We get through it when we get through it. And we're sitting in the meeting, and then we're going through the book. And then one day, we're going through, and it's, no, it's not a different day than any other day. And before we start the meeting, Kathy raises her hand and says, I have something I want to say to the group. And we said, sure, go ahead. And she said, uh, I've had the obsession to drink or use, drunk or sober, for nine years. I've had small lengths of sobriety along the way. And I've always come to you. I've always come to you. And I have never been relieved of the obsession to drink and use. And she said, I have not had the obsession to drink or use since our meeting last week. But this week, I've been free. I defy you to experience something like that and not be changed by it. Not be changed by it. To watch that woman struggle so courageously in the face of a disease that's going to win. It's going to win to suddenly be free. She's free to this day. She's free to this day. She's married to a guy we knew was never going to get sober and stay that way. We knew he's sober and staying that way. She's sober and staying that way. They are mighty examples of what can happen if you engage the process. 
they have a child. <laughs> They're two absolute maniacs are raising a human. <laughs> they made and are growing their own personal human. <laughs> and may I suggest that that little person is very, very fortunate. Questionable gene pool. <laughs> but a very fortunate child. Because those parents have in their lives something that the normal man takes for granted. They do not. They do not. That is the gift of today. It's a remark, this is a remarkable deal, right? So, I think that it's important to continue in the process, engage the process, keep moving. And I think that the original 100 knew that when I got to six and seven, that I was suddenly going to humbly ask God to remove my defects of character, that I was going to give up the defects of character, which I have so enjoyed along the way, that I would really, I would spend on step six, I don't know, you know, 12, 15 years, you know, become, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm entirely willing and tell, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making great strides, but I'm not entirely there. I mean, I'm entirely. I can these 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 ethereal concepts and ideas. I can just stay right there forever because I've read ahead. I've seen eight and nine, <laughs> and this needs to be delayed because I have letters to write to central office suggesting that. This needs to be reconsidered. <laughs> Eight and nine is absurd. That's absurd. It's like Scott R. talks about the guy who gets up at the podium was asked to read a portion of chapter five, and you can tell as he's reading it that he's he's never seen it before. He's reading it for the first time, and he's he's reading through the steps. He reads, you know, made direct demands whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. <laughs> Have you seen this? Just shocked that anybody would think that was a good idea. So I don't want to go anywhere near that, so I'm going to hover in six and seven. Great hovering steps, right? To get into just all the vagaries and the, you know, humility, willingness to learn. You know, I, you know, I'd love to get to eight, but I, you know, I'm on seven and I, I have to go to India, you know, to really make sure, you know, come back, you know, Come back as Mahatma Hightower before I can <laughs> go on to eight and nine. Eight and nine. Should we get into eight and nine now? We have 20 minutes. Not nearly enough time for eight and nine, is it? But I do have some lovely questions on the table. Should we have a moment for questions? So six and seven. Humbly ask God to remove your defects of character. Go ahead. And you know what? I ask God to remove the defects of character because I'll remove the wrong stuff. <laughs> if it's up to me, right, I have defects here. <laughs> I'll hang on to this for a little while. We'll talk again. Maybe we'll swap. Yeah. i got to get out of that. God, go in the bat. Take it. Take it. Take it. Thy will, not mine. Thy will, not mine. Donald used to always say from the podium when he would talk about me, he'd say, and I'm constantly having to tell Earl, your name is not thy. <laughs> so, you know, I would sit out there going, you know. <laughs> Which just made his day. He loved it. Here's a question. What do you say to a sponsee who has no part in any of his resentments? Let's try this again. That's what I say to him. Let's try this again. Give him some examples. Give him some exa examples. You know, where I would say, well, say, well, you, well, you know, you got a resentment? Yeah, what's your resentment this? You know, what are you, you know, what's this, who, this person? What's the areas of your life, uh, what specifically do you resent? Well, this, obviously. 
Well, what areas of your life are affected? Let's pick from these. Let's just see. What areas of your life? Well, this, 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 and this. Oh, all seven. Okay. Well, now, in my own life, here's an example. In In a situation like that, I might find that I might be dishonest in this way. That I might be frightened in this way. I might be self-seeking in this way. Can you identify, just kind of, you know, by the hand, a little bit by the hand, walk through and say, let's just suppose for a moment that this applies, right? And you just kind of like ease them into it, ease them into it, because it is extremely difficult for a lot of us. We feel so self-righteous in our anger and in our resentment. We feel so incredibly justified in feeling the way that we feel. Well, Earl, I've been told that my feelings are my feelings and that they shouldn't be judged. Yes, well, that's lovely, you know. <laughs> and I would never in any way attempt to discount your feelings about anything. You feel the way you feel. But we're talking about something else now, right? We're not talking that this is the way you feel. Of course it's the way you feel, right? Let's deal with the rest of it and let's see if we can't rid ourselves of some of these feelings. To resentment is to re-feel. Is it you're feeling this an event occurred when you were five, and to this day you continue, given the certain triggers or certain events line up a certain way, you re-feel this resentment towards this individual over and over and over and over again. Who is suffering as a result of re-feeling this is you. We're looking for a way out here. A legitimate way out. We're looking for legitimate relief. Legitimate relief. Not smoke and mirrors. Legitimate relief. So... I think you kind of got to walk them through sometimes. I, I saved, I did, an, I, I did a huge inventory when I was 10. I had 518 resentments. Apparently more does get revealed <laughs> as we move along, right? Um, and it was, a lot of people said I would have been splitting hairs, and I say, fine, you think I was splitting hairs, then don't do it. I, me, how free do you want to be? And I've since looked back at that at inventory, and three of those resentments are questionable now out of 518. Not bad, you know, that doing the rest of the that inventory stuff seemed to to work very well on that stuff. What else have I got here? Was I talking about something or did it just fade away or did I? Am I all right? Somebody answer me. <laughs> says, what is your advice for AA members who only sponsor members that have sober time versus newcomers? Okay. Okay. Do you only want to sponsor people with time? Fine. Um, but who are they going to sponsor? The people that you sponsor. Right? I remember there's a, there's a, there's a certain credential that um, you can get if you want to work in the field of, in treatment for chemical dependency. And on the test, one of the questions is, I actually wrote him a letter about this. <laughs> And I don't write letters, but that one, I thought, oh, I write them a letter. <laughs> as soon as I'm done with the four columns on this. Question, how much time should you have before your response or an AA? The answer to the question is five years. To which I thought, really? So if I'm sponsoring a guy and he's got, comes to me with five days and said, I'm afraid I'm going to drink any moment, what should I do? And I say, here we go. And we enter into this process and I engage the guy and we're going to meetings and he's working through the steps and he works through the steps. And this guy completes all 12 steps while he's going to meetings, has commitments in meetings, calling me on a daily basis. We're going through this thing. It's good. It's fierce. The guy's getting it. He's got 18 months of sobriety. He's completed all 12 steps. The lights have come on. This guy's on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. At which point I then say to him, okay, in three and a half years, I'm going to want you to begin to give this away to someone because because uh, uh, we don't like you to, you know, we find it a bit bit premature for you to be giving this away not until you're five. The fact that you have it to give away at 18 months is irrelevant. So again, we have this room, we have the half measures room, and then we have the holding room. <laughs> where all individuals who have worked the 12 steps but are not yet five hover. We have them over there. 
please, give it away. You want to keep it? Give it away. That's what we tell them. So give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Do it. Do you have any idea what took me there? Oh, this. So sponsors and only people sponsor us over time? I don't understand doing that at all. Unless possibly somebody thinks that sponsoring somebody who's new is an inconvenience. Because the new ones are oftentimes less than thrilled with the process. <laughs> Again, though, I think sponsoring people who's new is easy. Because if they come to me and say, Earl, I'm in big, big trouble. What do you think I should do? Well, read the doctor's opinion in the first eight pages of Bill's story. Um, ask yourself with each sentence, is this true for me? Do I identify with this? And if you do identify, if it's big for you, underline it. If you don't identify with it at all right now, if you don't know what the hell it means, put a question mark. Right? And then call me back. Well, I don't want to do that. Okay. And don't do it. But if you, if you want what I got, you got to do what I did to get it. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine with me. But maybe you should get somebody else to sponsor you who's, you know, going to do it your way. Which, I may I add, so far, going very well. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want them to like me. I want them to live. You know what I mean? I don't want them to like me. I want them to live. That's why I love Donald Madden. I needed my ass kicked. I got my ass kicked. When I needed a hug, I got a hug. Right? He did, Donald Mann didn't care if I liked him. He wanted me to live. He loved me enough to tell me the truth. And his truth was far more evolved than mine. This is a remarkable man. An absolutely remarkable man. So... I, I, people say to me, well, how can you tell the new guy okay when you know it's not going to work? And this is my reason. If alcoholism has not beaten that individual into a state of reasonableness like the book suggests, how the hell am I going to? We've already proven beyond a shadow of a doubt alcoholism is far more powerful than I am. Okay? I fought the beast and I lost every round. Okay? So what I can suggest by my example is a contrary way of living to a new person. If somebody comes to me and says, I like the light in your eyes, I like this buzz idea, let's catch the buzz, I say, fine, this is what we do to get it. If you do it, you'll get it. It won't have anything to do with me. It'll be your journey, your experience, your victory, your life, your understanding, your buzz. It won't be. people. If you walk around, catch the buzz of this thing, people are not going to say, oh, look. He got Earl Buzz. They'll say, oh, look, Bob caught the buzz. Bob fired up. Bob's smiling. Bob was a nasty individual. Bob's not nasty anymore. Bob's kind of nice. I had a woman just come to me and say, uh, she's a mean woman. It's a mean, ornery woman. You, whenever she gets called on, everybody just kind of hunkers down in their seat. Right? Because it's going to be venomous. You know? This goddamn program and all you little people. Chirp, 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 chirp. Towing the party line, bunch of sheep. Whenever I'm leading a meeting and I call and I finish, I say, thank you for sharing. Sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Just to piss her off a little more. I said, well, you know what? what? You know, why don't you, and one day she do it, and I was just in a bad mood, and she came out, rah, 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 rah. and I said, you know what? How annoying are you? We all know you're pissed off. We get it, okay? You're angry. You're not happy. Got it. Don't want to know any more about it. How about this? If you want something different, why don't you stop doing what you keep doing because you keep getting the same thing? Why don't you do something different? I got an idea. Why don't you get a commitment here? Why don't you be a greeter? <laughs> and every time I come to the meeting, you shake my hand and say, Hi, you're welcome. I'll know what you're really thinking. <laughs> but I dare you to smile at me and tell me, Welcome, Earl. She got a commitment. You know what? She loves that meeting now. Now, how can that be? 
How can that be? <laughs> it's just, it's, to see, that's the cool thing about this. It's really simple. That's why it's so tough for us. We're so dramatic. You know? I mean, as alcohol, I mean, it would probably work better if they, when we got sober, they said, okay, you're sober now, you want to do this, anything? Good. Here, here's a car, here's an address on this piece of paper. If you go to this address, you will find the AA library. We have over a hundred thousand volumes of how, of how this works. We suggest you get started immediately. A hundred thousand books. Right! I'm on my way. Where are you going? Can't talk! I got a hundred thousand books to read. By when? I'm going to, uh, Friday. I'll be done by Friday. It's intense, it's big, it's grandiose. Instead, we come in and go, wow, dying of alcoholism, going insane, alienated from family, friends, God, isolated beyond belief, right? Experiencing a level of madness you did not think the human mind or the human body could, could bear, right? I mean, if you sunk to levels you thought below the human experience, this, you couldn't, you're in an unknown, unreal place of madness and despair. Bummer. Here's a book. <laughs> you know, and people just go, yeah, okay, coaster. <laughs> not dramatic enough. Just not dramatic enough. So then you go to the meetings, and of course, we're all lone wolves. We're all the bad guy. We're all the cocaine cowboy, aren't we? Everybody's a tough guy. It's just hysterical to me. I can't tell you how many times in AA I've heard somebody say, you know, I'm going to kick his ass. Please. I've been to thousands of AA meetings. I've seen like four ass weapons in the whole time I've been. <laughs> Everybody's a tough guy. <laughs> what was I talking about? Questions? More? Do another one? I feel like I should say when I have a question. Here's a question. Does the fear inventory have four columns? I know it's not big. person who asked this question, don't feel insulted. That's a really good response to the question. It's in here. This will tell you. My favorite, favorite, I was living with a woman. We got engaged at some point. Neither of us knows why. We were living together. This is a woman who'd been in and out for years and years and years and years. We met it. I mean, it was just boom, right? One of those across the crowded room things, you know, the ones that I've learned that when that happens, turn and run, right? It's not going to go well. And she came up to me and we were living and she goes, where's the third step? Said, it's in the book. Said, yeah, yeah, I know. Where in the book? I said, who am I to rob you of the experience of discovering that for yourself? Take your own journey. Stop asking for everybody to smooth the bumps out for you. Invest something. Invest. Sit down, find two, and read from there. You're going to hit it. Into the book. Find it. Don't ask me. She looked at me and she goes, uh, I know where it is. It's in that chapter, We Antagonists, isn't it? <laughs> and I said... You got me. <laughs> Go find it in the chapter entitled, We Antagonists. <laughs> I've often thought, we got to write that chapter. That's a great chapter. This is going to love that. Anyway, so that's, that's the, the discovery, the process of doing it. How you get, we're not going to sit in here and go through, no, 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 no. We're get in a book study. You don't have one, start one. You don't know how to lead it? Buy the Joe and Charlie tapes from the original Joe and Charlie series, series, Charlie series. The big book comes alive, right? And use that and go through the book. Stop the tape, talk about it. Put a little more. Stop the tape, talk about it. Put Scott R. in. Put me in. Put us all on and de debate about who really understands this. Come up with your own set that says we're all full of it. This is the way to go. Love that. Love that. Find your own way. 
that's all that's going to work, right? Did you, you didn't drink his way. You didn't use her way. Come on out of it together. This is, this is the road map. These are the guidelines. This is the text suggesting that we study it. You gotta get in and wrestle with it. Wrestle with it. You're gonna, you're gonna get it perfect? Nope. You, we're gonna give you a degree? Be happy to. Be happy to give you, do you want a degree? Give you one. Call me up. Give me a fax number. I'll put a diploma together for you and shoot it right out. I actually made one up for a guy I sponsored. Who said he was finished with the steps. I said, really? Right. So we had a graduation ceremony for him. <laughs> Nino. We graduated him from AA. I said, now what do you want to do? He says, I'm getting the feeling that you would like me to go to another meeting. I said, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I would. Good, we'll go together. <laughs> right? I got, I got a red light. So I've answered that, I've answered that, I've answered that. I answered that one very well. This one is um, an outside topic. So as soon as we're done and this gets shut off, I'll answer that one. And that one. And I'm on time. Look at that. Look at that. I'm on time. Go to lunch. See you in an hour. Hope everybody had a nice lunch. Good. So now we'll see a nap from 2.10 to 4. And we'll just wrap it up real quick. <clears throat> well. Uh, oh, questions. We have good questions. Questions. What if, you're, what if you've completed your fourth and fifth step with your sponsor, but still have many resentments against your sponsor? <laughs> well, if the bo bottom half of that is true, then the, second, the first half isn't. And then you haven't completed your fourth and fifth step. If I get, if I'm listening to the fifth step of a sponsee and I'm not mentioned, I don't feel like I've been doing my job properly. <laughs> Um, yeah, go ahead and, if you've got resentments against your sponsor, go ahead and, and work, do it in a four-step format. I don't think your sponsor's going to be alarmed. I would find it really curious if they were. I mean, if I told them, I resent my sponsor, because he told me to do this, and I didn't want to, and my sponsor, oh, well, just walked out. It's, it's crazy. It just, put it down. How free do you want to be? Right? You want to walk around feeling like you've been harboring resentments against your sponsor, the person that you defer to, the person that you seek direction and counsel from? Bad idea. Get it clean. Say so. Take care of that. How do I get rid of the fear of letting go? I feel unable to let go of the notion of drinking again safely. Unable to accept this fact. I know I must. So someone's afraid to let go of the idea that they can drink again at some point. When you have a question, what's a good idea to do? Go to the book. Well, I don't need to. The book says... The persistence of this illusion, this belief in a lie that I can drink like a normal man, is astonishing. Many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. Okay? So, if you identify as an alcoholic, but you, you, you can't let go of the idea of reserving the right, that somehow, someday, you may able, be able to drink like a normal man. You may be able to safely drink. I suggest that the solution to that dilemma is to do precisely what it is we're doing. Begin the fourth to twelve step process. Engage in the process. 
engage in the process. Wrestle with that is as you go through this process. I don't. None of us likes the idea. I mean, I don't. I've never met an alcoholic who said. So basically, here's where it's at, pal. You know this drinking thing that you've been doing? You know this thing that, that's protected you from the world, the thing that's made it possible for you to leave the house, this source of the only ease and contentment you've ever known, right? Um, this thing that has made all things to this point possible for you, um, it's over and you don't get to do it anymore. <laughs> I've never had an alcoholic get that information and say, oh, well, okay, then, fine. Right? It's a crushing blow to discover that it doesn't work anymore and you're not going to get it back. That's why we've got a portion of chapter three more about alcoholism. That's why the list goes on ad infinitum, as the book suggests, of the attempts we go to switching from uh, um, 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 scotch to light wine, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off with or without a solemn oath. I mean, all these beer to light wine. I mean, all this stuff that we do to try to find a way to make it work. Never drinking before five, only on the weekends. Vowing right to admit oneself to a sanitarium. Should this blah, 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 blah. Right? We do all that find, desperately trying to find a way to make it work. The, deny, the persistence of this illusion that we can drink like normal men is astonishing. Right? So it's a very, very powerful influence in us. That's why most of us have to be beaten nearly to death before we're willing to say, okay, I give, I surrender. So yeah, it's, uh, and I completely get the, the notion and the idea that yes, I'm an alcoholic, but I don't know that I'm willing to do this. Yes, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not done yet. Or yes, I'm an alcoholic, but must it be this severe? <laughs> this, to <laughs> this total abstinence? <laughs> How about we just shoot for Friday? I'm good with Friday. Right? We'll drink Friday like normal men. It's a plan. Yeah, yeah. That's a good plan. We'll drink Friday. But it, but you have and stop Friday? So begin and end drinking on the the same Friday? <laughs> You're getting into splitting hairs. You know where this is going, right? If I could drink safely, I would. How do you get rid of the fear of letting go? By letting go and finding that you're still okay. That's how you get rid of the fear of letting go, by letting go. <laughs> I feel unable to let go of the notion drinking again safely, unable to accept this fact. I know I must. Then by all means, grab a hold of this process and begin to do the things that we're talking about today. Do them. It's the action that brings about the change. I mean, let's face it. Um, you, who are now horrified that I have singled you out. This won't hurt a bit. Yeah, trust me. She's looking at me like that. We'll see, pal. <laughs> you can sit there and pretty much assume what it looks like from here, right? I mean, we're in the same room. You've been walking around. You've looked. You 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 got a pretty good idea, don't you? What this room looks like from here, sitting there, don't you? All right. The only way you can really know is to get up, please. Get up. Come over here. No, stay, keep focusing on me. Stay on me. Stay on me. Okay, now. Okay, good. <laughs> now turn around. A little different than you thought, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. That's a rugged group, isn't it? <laughs> I got my hands full, don't I? Yeah. yeah, all right. Thank you very much. I suddenly feel like those, I think those magic guys feel when they have the little, <laughs> thank the lovely assistant thing. That was good. I like that. Anyway, you get what I mean? You got to take the action to find out. Like you got to go try and surf to find out about the surf thing. 
Right? You want to, you get, but see, the thing is, is that it doesn't matter what your attitude is, does it? You can think, okay, Earl's on my next inventory for that little episode, right? <laughs> or he's in Earl for, he made me, right? Doesn't matter. Or you can think, oh, I wonder where this is leading and be just perfectly fine with it, right? Not self-conscious or anything. We're safe here. We're among friends, right? And, and just kind of exploring, just going along because you decided to trust me and just do this thing, right? And, it doesn't matter where your head's at. It doesn't matter if you're afraid. It doesn't matter if it, it, it's hard for you. If you do it, you get a result. Right? So, I can go to the gym, right, and, and lift weights for 10 minutes. And at the end of this 10 minutes, I look to a friend of mine and I say, you know this weightlifting thing, these weights? They're very heavy. I've discovered. And I, and the, the value of picking up this heavy stuff just to put it back down again, just to pick it back up again, just to put it back down again, over and over and over again, is stupid. This is stupid. I hate it. Right? However, with this mindset, every other day I go to the gym thinking, I'm going to the stupid gym. And I'm going to pick up these unreasonably heavy objects repeatedly. And I'm going to go home. I see no point in this. I see no value. This is stupid. What happens? You get stronger, don't you? You go to the gym every other day and pick up heavy stuff and put it back down again. You're going to get stronger. It will, the action that you take will affect a change. Right? Doesn't matter what you think about it. Like my sponsor said, you don't have to like this. You don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. If you do it, take the actions that are suggested here. It will affect a change in your life. So you can be afraid of all this stuff, of letting go of the option of drinking. But if you do this contrary, contrary action, it will bring about a change in your life. You may find yourself looking at it differently. You find, may find yourself relieved of the fear of letting go because you have. And you're okay. And all that you're missing is the component that's killing you. <laughs> Good deal. Okay? Well, I believe I've addressed that. Now, step eight. Step nine. Steps eight and nine. Step eight, made a list. Harmless enough. <laughs> a rather benign step, wouldn't you say? What are you doing? I'm making a list. Of what? People have harmed. And I'm going to become willing to make amends to them all. Now, in the book, a lot of conversation, like I said before, because they're letting me out of the house. I'm going to go talk to people now. I'm going to go expose them to the new wonder of Earl. I'm going to let a little of my light shine upon them. I'm going to expose them to a remarkable spiritual path. How lucky for them. <laughs> I'm always amazed. Are you all feeling a little lethargic? You ate? And we're all kind of sitting here because you got a different energy about you right now. Before lunch, I'm getting a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Bring it on. I mean, yeah. And now I'm getting like this. I'm getting... That's great, Earl. It's great. Beautiful. So let's just shake it off, all right? Got to stay in the room. Got to stay here. I had my lunch in three minutes. I ate with many fellas. We had a lot of guys. We went to lunch, right? Everybody got served. was enjoying a lovely meal while I waited for mine. I got mine, wolfed it down. Believe me, I'm fighting the urge to do this. <sighs> but then that's what caffeine is for. Eight and nine. Tricky. Very, very tricky. 
High wire without a net. Dangerous steps. All right? Follow me closely. Lives hang in the balance. I'm going to demonstrate now. And if I get hurt, I get hurt, and we'll just have to get another speaker. Because, you know, you never know if you're going to make it through one of these, but I'm going to demonstrate the precarious nature of amends. Okay? You ready? I'm very sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I did steal your car. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm sorry. I estimate the value of the car at $10,000 at the time of the theft. If that is acceptable to you, I will give you this check and I will pay you monthly until that balance is cleared and I will not go steal his car and sell it to pay you for the car I stole from you. <laughs> to make amends means to change. So amends is not a get out of jail free card. You know? I don't get to insult you, apologize, and then five minutes later, insult you, apologize. I'm clean. Let's keep moving. I hate you. Sorry. <laughs> right? You never should have had children. Sorry. <laughs> My favorite tent... I'll get into that later. Remind me to talk about Bobby A., one of the great minds of AA on how to get around this sort of stuff. <laughs> I love the links we will go to to avoid just doing it. You know, except to say, I make direct demands whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Okay? I'm a, I'm a firm believer that I don't go back to the drug dealer that I ripped off. Right? Um, knock on the door of the den itself, go into the depths of the den to Mr. Evil and say, about those two uh, kilos of cocaine, <laughs> you know, I'm really sorry about that, man. <laughs> this, is a, this is an idiot in action here. <laughs> there are other ways. Now, a lot of guys will tell you there's no such thing as a living amends. Have you heard that one? How many have heard there's no such thing as a living amends? Okay, no such thing as a living amends. Okay. Um, I, however, <laughs> um, there are certain things that I do on a daily basis in my life that are uh, uh, in the nature of an amends. Am I clean? Yeah. Do I walk the earth a free man? Yeah. Are there certain amends that I make kind of as an ongoing aspect of my life? Yes, to people who have died. Can you make amends to dead people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Write them a letter. Make the amends. How do you know they're not listening? Right? And is it really necessary that they hear it or that you say it? You know? My side of the street. My side of the street. I'm cleaning my side of the street. I don't pay back people my money. I pay them back their money. My side of the street. My side of the street. i got to get my side of the street clean. That's what I'm trying to do here. In 4 and 5, I set things straight about the stuff that I'm putting between me and you and me and God. I clean it up to the best of my ability. 6 and 7, I hook it back up with God, asking God to remove the defects of character because I'll remove the wrong stuff. When I'm hooking it back up with you, I'm clearing away the stuff that I put between us. I, it's an amazing capacity, the capacity of this alcoholic to borrow $1,500 from you and to be paid back a week from Tuesday. When you approach me a week from Tuesday, I am insulted at the badgering. <laughs> How I can turn your kindness and generosity towards me as my, into my resentment towards you effortlessly. Right? This is a bizarre way of doing things that I'm quite capable of. I gotta get out of this. Who's gonna get me out of this? You? 
Oh, there's a plan. This is a good plan. My life, my life is now, my personal well-being is contingent upon what you do or don't do. That's a good way to live. Right? If I do that, I'm at the mercy of buffoons. I have, I made a pledge in my life, in my amends, in my life, in an attempt to change who I am. I made a pledge to nonviolence. That I am now, and I am not a violent man. I do not raise my hand to other human beings. I don't do that. And that is not contingent upon what you do or don't do. If that's the case, then I'm at the mercy of fools. Right? I'm nonviolent until you come up and say something offensive to me. And then I'm violent. I mean, they're, prisons are filled with guys that go to sleep every night saying, yeah, you know, I really wish I hadn't done that. If only he hadn't said that to me. Right? It's, it's insanity. If I decide to be nonviolent, then I decide that's my commitment. And it's not con contingent upon what you do or don't do. If I'm going to decide I do this inventory work and I recognize and come to a place where I understand that I am responsible for this and I need to make amends to you from my side of the street, then that's that. That's what I do. I go and I apologize. What you do with that is not the point. Has got nothing to do with, right? I mean, people say, you know, I made amends that, you know, I did what you said, Earl. I went out and I made amends and the guy threw me out of his office. <laughs> okay? So the amends thing doesn't work as far as I'm concerned. So sure it does. Did you make the amends? Yes. Did you mean it? Yes. Then it worked. He threw me out. Yeah. That's up to him. That's his decision for him. That's not what we don't concern ourselves with that. This is my side of the street. I must clean my side of the street. I had a, uh, um, Al, used to, guy who spawned my second sponsor, used to say that he turned his will and his life over to the care of God and God turned it over to the sheriff's department. <laughs> and he faced multiple felonies. And he faced them. And he walks the earth a free man. He's not looking over his shoulder for any, anything or anybody. He's free. That is the idea here, isn't it? To get free. So, I continue to take personal inventory when I'm wrong properly. Admit, ten step, let me go back. Nine, I make these direct amends. I lived in a one-room apartment for six and a half years because all my money went to making amends. When I came in, I believed that if I were to make direct amends wherever possible, um, I would uh, pay. I would live in this one-room apartment for the rest of my life. All the money I made would go to paying people off, and when I died, I would assign the remainder of the debt to any children I might have at the time. At six and a half years, my sponsor said, you get to move to a nice place now and continue this process, which I did. And it took me a total of nine and a half years to make my amends. And whenever I thought to myself, I've never been to Europe, I'd think, well, when I do go to Europe, I'm going as a free man. When I would think, that's such a nice suit there, I would think, I would love to wear that as a free man. When I would this or that, or I'd meet some woman and I'd decide I need to shower her with gifts because clearly I alone am not enough. <laughs> I would think to myself, it would be nice to be in a relationship, a free man. A free man. See, I was a slave my whole life, from 12 to 28. Every minute of my adult life, I was a slave to alcohol and drugs. I want to be free. So I'm willing to do what's necessary. And as a result, I'm catching the buzz that I'm catching. Right? So, when in doubt, just do it. Just take the next step. You don't know what's going to come. Like I said before, the great news about this thing is, is that whatever it is I know, there's more. So there's a new understanding as a result of new action. There's a new experience as a result of staying the course. All I have to do, if it, you would think that if I chop wood and carry water and I walk from here to there and back and forth and back and forth, all I'm ever going to get is here to there and back and forth and back and forth. It's not how it works. This one book is not the same book they handed me when I got here. This book is not the same book that I went through for the first time. This is not the same book I went through for the 26th time. This is a completely new book for me. It is astonishing how I can sit with the new ones and say, okay, let us continue. You know, all right. And if your man accepts your offer, it should be pointed out that the... Wow, that's really quite interesting, isn't it? 
To get over drinking will require a transformation of thought and attitude. We had to replace recovery. But oh, isn't that interesting that I'd read that today? How pertinent that is to my... That little scenario there has just happened countless times in my life. Joe and Charlie's thing, the big book comes alive. Never have I heard of a process described more appropriately. The big book comes alive. It does. It's not black ink on white pages. Over there to be read and observed is something over here on this page. It actually comes to life. And how does that happen? How does what's written in here come to life? It comes to life when we pick up the concepts and ideas outlined in this book and execute them in our lives. That's how it comes to life. That's how it comes to life. When you all come into AA and they say, read about this book, how should I do that? And they say, well, there's people here that have several years, some of them many, many years of sobriety, that are conducting big book studies. You think, curious? You'd think at 22 years, he'd have gotten it by now. <laughs> Maybe that's not why he's doing it. Maybe that's not why he gets on an airplane and flies from L.A. to New York on Friday the 13th. <laughs> Which by any, any reasonable human would say, that's unreasonable to stay home. My way of looking at things. Why would he do that? He's read it. Stop pestering people. At home. No. Bagels and Big Book. Is this necessary? I don't see that it is. It's not necessary. It's just how it comes alive. It's how it comes to life. Because I'll tell you what, when I was new, when I came through the doors, when you were talking, what I heard was blah, 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 blah. And I would go, oh, that's very nice, thank you. I don't understand a word of what you were saying. I mean, my head, I say this often, but it bears repeating. In my head, I mean, I would go to Amy's and I would sit and I would say, all right, all right, I found my seat, I found my seat, I found my seat. It's great, it's great, it's great. The guy's up, he's up, he's reading, he's reading, he's reading. Re rarely saw something, rarely saw something. You know, I'm going to have to get one of those books and find out what the hell he rarely saw. Because, you know, that just kind of went by me. You know, what's going on over there? Oh, 12 things, 12, yeah, those 12 things, 12 steps, yeah. I read the thing on the wall. Very nice, very nice. Yes. And ABC, ABC, 12 things, ABC, good, good, yeah. I didn't get a lot of that, but, you know, I mean, it's fine. Just inside of my head, just bing, 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 bing. Just insane, you know what I mean? There's ideas, beautiful, spiritual, deep principles just bouncing off my skull. You know, just not getting in, you know? You know? I mean, when I, I, all I, I gotta do is go meeting, listen, man, go home, no drink. You know? And pace in the apartment. Jesus Christ, what was that guy talking about? He was talking about something. You know, but what I, you know what? And, and it, was, it was blah, 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 blah. But I'm looking at the guy up there. I'm looking at the guy, and he's talking about how he drank. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, that guy's having a very good time. He seems very comfortable being who he is. I mean, the best definition of happiness I've ever heard is wanting what you've got. That guy seems happy. He seems to be enjoying his life. He doesn't seem to be fettered down with all these problems and indecision and, you know, I mean, it's clear to me, you know, people look at me and they think, step back, I think his skull's going to explode. You know what I mean? Just this very tense person all the time. If I was awake, you know, a little anxious. <laughs> and this guy's comfortable, you know, he's just, he's cool, he's up, he's good, he's good, he's good. And I think, that's an example. I don't know what he's got, but he's got something. I don't know why he continues to be here, because clearly whatever it is you get, he's got. I don't understand why, but thank God he's there. I'm going to go ask him how he got that. You seem relatively calm. How? How? Really, you want to know how to be calm? Yeah. I know I'm standing still, but it, he says, yeah, but you look like you're going about 60 miles an hour, Earl, standing there. Yeah. Calm, need calm, <laughs> help calm, get calm. Okay, read this. Okay. Now, I could have said, excuse me, I don't understand why reading this is going to make me feel better. I don't get it. Explain it to me. No. Why not? 
because you're not going to get that either. I'm speaking newcomerese to you. Like Donald used to do to me. He took me to the meeting and said, Earl, we make six, we make 550 cups of coffee here every Friday night for the next year. You're making them. I said, screw you. I'm ready to kill myself for several other people at any moment. And here you are saying to me, make a little coffee. <laughs> this particular moment in my life. And he said, fine, then drink. I said, you see, there's no talking to you people. I'm trying to have a conversation about this. The problem at hand. I'm being current. And you, what you give me is make coffee or drink. Fine, I'll make the damn coffee. Now, he could have said, Earl, let me explain something to you. There's this thing called out spiritual service out of self, right? Huge. One of the biggest gifts we have in here. And in the fellowship we get together, what we try to do is we try to take actions and, and do things in a certain way to, to, to demonstrate what can happen to people around here, the value of certain things. So you're probably thinking, because you're the new guy, you're the grunt, we're giving you the dirty work or we're going to make you make our coffee for us. That's not what's happening. We're giving you a great gift. See, because every Friday night, you're going to spend four and a half hours Get into the meeting, get in the pots filled with water. You go, in the middle of the week, you gotta go out there and you gotta get your little condiment thing together. You gotta get the coffee and the little swizzler things and you gotta get the this and the that. You gotta get the tea for the little tea people and you gotta get the, you know, three different kinds of sugar, the real kind, the pink fake, the blue fake. You gotta get the other, you gotta get all this stuff together so you got all your table and you got everything ready and you gotta go fill the pots and you gotta put the pots together and you gotta make the coffee and you got everything right. You gotta put the pots in different places so you don't blow out the fuses, right? So you get everything together and you gotta make the coffee. You got the coffee for the people. And then the people, and then being a little intense, no, right? I got my coffee set up and the guy comes up and he gets the cup of coffee and he puts the swizzle stick down on the table. I'm over there. Yeah, bro. You born in a barn? Pick that up. So I am running this coffee area right here. Unacceptable. People are in the meeting going, dude, the coffee guy. <laughs> What's this, the coffee guy? And the sponsor comes in and goes, no more coffee for you. Because I'm in the back just... Because <sighs> I've had nine cups of the turbo pot over here. You know what I mean? They used to say that my, there was a five 100-cup pots and then there was one 55-cup pot. And they used to say about that pot that three cups was a slip. <laughs> I made fierce coffee. What I discovered as a result of doing this, right, was that... I didn't get to think about it all for four and a half hours on Friday night. I was too busy worrying about the coffee and making sure that I didn't screw it up and get fired from AA <laughs> to think about me. Tremendous relief. I left there every Friday night feeling better because the self-centered guy like me wasn't thinking about me. I was being of service. Out of self, more God. Out of self, more God. The healing was happening. I'm an alcoholic who knows if he drinks, he's going to die. And part of what I do for that is I make 550 cups of coffee for total strangers every Friday night. And healing begins. Now, as a newcomer, if you'd have said that to me, it would have done like most things did. Just... But you said, do it or drink. Got it. <laughs> make the coffee. And I could be angry and just not like it and have a bad attitude. As long as I did it, I got the result. As long as I did it, I got the result. The ninth step is no different. You do it, you get the result. Doesn't matter if they're happy with you, mad at you. Doesn't matter. Love you, think you're wonderful. One of the things that I was told to avoid when I did my ninth step was to avoid going out and saying, listen, I'm a sober man now. I'm on a spiritual path. Powerful, you say? I think so. <laughs> a very, very powerful sober man now. Um, great events are occurring in my life, and I'm going to share them with you now. And when we're done, you're going to leave thinking, thank God I know that man. <laughs> my life is different, and may I say, quite a great deal better, having known him. The transformation, the turnaround... He is a message for us all, isn't he? Please. I'm sorry. Here's your money back in the house. Get out of this hole. You know, what a, ain't I great? No, I'm sorry.
You may, and change, to make amends means to change. Change, I don't do that anymore. I lied to you, you were hurt by it, and I'm sorry. Anything I can do to make this right, let me know. And I'll be happy to do it. And so that you know, I'm really working on the lying thing. Right? Now, I don't know about you, as for the lying thing, I lie. I will lie for no reason. I don't know if you are familiar with the lying for no reason. <laughs> it's a remarkable moment, in, in, isn't it? When somebody says to me, Earl, how are you? Good. What'd you do today? I went to the movies. As I think to myself, you didn't go to the movies. <laughs> Why did you tell this person that you just went to the movies? This in no way improved your standing with this person to tell them that you went to the movies. You said, I went to the movies. They went, oh, good. Yeah. There was no point in it. It served no purpose. It had no value. You clearly lied just instantly, out of nowhere, for no reason. And the only thing I've been able to come up with on this, the only reason I can figure that that happens from time to time, is because in some part of me, I'm very, very worried that I'm going to become bad at it. And you never know when you're... You never know when you're going to need a really good one, right? So you just occasionally throw one out there to kind of keep it oiled up. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> That's the only reason I can come up with. I have no idea why that happens. I, 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 many people that I know have had the experience of saying, asking me something, I've answered it, and as soon as I was finished answering it, I said, you know that was a lie, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we're used to that, Earl. It's not a problem. You know, here's what really happened. I, that's another great gift in recovery, by the way, is the ability to, the opportunity to go, go to somebody and say, in the middle of a conversation, I'm in the middle of a conversation with you, and be able to go, time out, time out, erase everything I just said. I'm, I'm bending the truth, I'm, you know what I mean? I don't like the way this is going. You know, I'm behaving like an idiot. You know what? And the fact is, I'm not an idiot. I'm just behaving like one right now. And I, let's start this over. Now, another recovering person is going to go, wow, that was cool. A normie <laughs> may be a bit alarmed by this. <laughs> Don't be concerned. They get to drink. They'll work their way through it. <laughs> I got to clean it up as soon as I can, which brings us to 10. Now, I believe the action plan to be one is problem, two solution, three decision, four and five me, six and seven God, eight and nine you. Four through nine action plan to bring the solution of step two about in my life. To make it not words on a page, but to make it real for me by these actions that I take. Okay? 10, 11, and 12 keep me in the game. 10 is me, 11 is God, and 12 is you. Because as I go through four and nine, I can do this to the absolute best of my ability and I can begin to affect the change in my life. But, odds are, having lived the way I've lived for so many years, I'm barely scratching the surface on this stuff. There's worlds within worlds here. This stuff goes as deep as you want to take it. Right? But in that first pass, I've introduced myself to the, the processes that are available there, the principles that are afoot in those steps, the nature of relationships with God, self, and others. I've introduced myself to this. I want to keep this rolling in my life. I want to keep this going in my life. I don't want to do a nice little one-day workshop and then go back to my old ways. I beseech you. How long has it been since someone beseeched you? <laughs> I beseech you. Do not do that. Make a move. Make a move in your own defense, in defense of your own life. Take an action. Do something different. Do something in addition to what you currently do. Add to the mix. Expand, enlarge upon what we already have, right? 10, 11, and 12 allow me to do that. Allow me to keep the ball rolling. 10, me, 11, God, 12, you. Which we will explore immediately following the break.
for Annie. Annie, you're not here, um, but I wanted to say hello and extend my very best wishes to you personally, and I hope we meet soon. None of you know what just happened, and that's just fine. <laughs> so, question. When a sponsee says, what happens if I quit and find out later that I didn't have to? <laughs> May I suggest that a normal man would not ask this question? Because a normal man would recognize that if that were the case, all you'd missed was a few drinks. <laughs> In this individual's case, I would suggest if you found that out that you would have missed an awful lot of drinks. <laughs> so, um, I would just simply say, I wouldn't worry about that. Just keep moving. More will get revealed. If you're not an alcoholic and you've missed a few drinks, big deal. If you are an alcoholic and have missed a few drinks, big deal. <laughs> ah, an alternative opinion to what I stated about resentments regarding your sponsor. What if you uh, um, do your inventory and when you're finished you realize you still have resentments against your sponsor? An alternative opinion was voiced, which I think is very good that what you do is is that you take these resentments and this aspect of your inventory to a third party, an alternate third party, possibly with a significant amount of time, and that you can read this stuff, and when you get to your part in it, you can then go back and make amends to your sponsor. Love that. Thank you, Ava. That came directly from a member of the Bagels and Big Book group, our sponsor. I love that. Earl H., sponsored by the Big Book and let's see what this is. So what's with the eyeball to eyeball thing on the ninth step? Like I can't get to South Dakota to make this amends. Won't a letter do? Help. Okay. Okay. Send them a letter. Make them a videotape and send them the videotape. Asking them to burn it Im immediately after watching it. Kind of a, what was that show? I'm kind of a Mission Impossible thing. This all is anyway, isn't it? Um, South Dakota, make this some, yeah. Yeah, I, if you can go to South Dakota, go to South Dakota. If you can't, give them a phone call. Read them the letter. Make the amends. Write them the letter. Do what you gotta do. Gotta be, we're willing to go to any lengths to do this stuff. Alright? So if you tell me you can't go to South Dakota, I say, okay, you can't go. But you can get significant communication regarding this matter to that individual, can't you? And be available for their response. All right? So if they have some need on the other end to say something to you about this, that they have the opportunity to do so. All right? Okay. Here's a good one. In the eighth step, how serious does the harm have to be? Whoever wrote this, I love you. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, I was shooting to kill, but it was only wounded. No amends necessary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love that. Harm is harm. If you have harmed someone, we don't, we don't, we don't have degrees of harm. Right? Harm is harm. If you've harmed someone, make amends. You don't know that the impact this has had on that particular individual. It's not, we don't decide for someone else how much harm we've caused them. We don't know the extenuating circumstances of their lives. We don't know. I mean, I can, um, be goofing around at a party and push someone into a pool, right? And well, all I've done is embarrass that person publicly, and that requires an amends. I apologize for embarrassing you publicly. I had no right to treat you that way, and I apologize if there's anything I can do to set this right. Please tell me what it is, and I'll be more than happy to engage in that, in that activity to see that this is made right by you. 
Um, however, I might be at the same party and push another person in the pool. It's the same action, right? Uh, that person almost drowned as a child and is deathly afraid of water. And this is a terrifying experience for this individual. Brings up a lot of their past. I mean, it's really, really a remarkably unsettling experience to them that throws them into a semi-catatonic state as they sink to the bottom of the pool and someone has to dive in and save them. Did I harm them the same? I did the same thing to them I did to the other person. Is that what it's about? What I did? I make amends, right? I make amends. You make amends. You don't sit there and go, well, you know, they got wet, big deal. I got to make amends to the person I traumatized with the other person. Eh, it's minor. No. Make amends. Harm's harm. Set it straight. Set it straight. It's like, it's, it's like well, you know, I make amends for all, you know, I pay back money in excess of 10 grand. Or I have limited liability in all theft, and I only pay up to ten grand. <laughs> no, <laughs> set it straight. All right. Um, what was the other thing? Somebody else mentioned to me something that I say that was pertinent to the ninth step. Speak up. Where are you? You came up and you shared with me something that I talked about that you said was pertinent. There you are naturally right in front of me, and I couldn't see you. Yes. Right. It's like, what's the point and the value of all this stuff, right? When I came to AA, you see, these conceptually, these things all tie together. We may have to go back to the tape and review, but I'm certain that they do. I came into AA and believed that there was, you know, because I was in it for me, the self-centered nature of being new. I believed if I came in and I was honest with you, then you would be honest with me, that this would be the result of my action. Because for me, it was all about the expectation I had on the back end of the, of the action. You get what I mean? I'm not being honest with you because that's a good thing to be. I'm being honest with you so you'll be honest with me. That that's what I'm after. I'm still, do you notice here, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm still attempting to control and manipulate my environment. You see how I'm doing that? I'm being honest with you only so that you'll be honest with me. I'm trying to get you to give me what I think it is I need from you. That if I love you, then you will love me. What am I, what am I in, what am I doing this for? I'm doing this so that you'll love me because I need to be loved. It's about me. I'm attempting to manipulate the situation. Right? If I show you respect, then you will be respectful of me. And I was completely wrong. That's selling it, you're selling it short. Way short. If I'm honest with you, the reward is, is that I become an honest man. If I love you, then I become a loving man. If I'm respectful of you, then I become a respectful man. That these are the rewards. It changes me here. What you do with my... Because I was honest with you and you lied through your teeth to me. I showed you respect and you embarrassed me publicly for no reason other than to dampen my light so yours would look a little brighter. Not you personally, but you get, get what I'm saying. Though I did find this one question a bit challenging. Kidding. Everybody that put a question up here is going... A little shit's talking about me. <laughs> Earl. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? This side of the street. I do this to be this, to become this, not to get from you. What you do is your business. I am powerless over that. One of the great gifts of sobriety, serenity prayer. Remember, the, you know, everybody talks about, God grant me the courage to accept the things I cannot change, the courage, to change, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the willingness to know there wasn't no difference, willingness wasn't. This is an example of, of, of sleep deprivation. <laughs> God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the willingness to know the difference. And everybody gets caught up in a lot of that. You know what the, remember what the first three words of that prayer are. God grant me. Where I seek this. This will all make sense in a minute. Where I seek this. Right? That's, I have to pay attention to that. What can I change? Me. What can't I change? Norman. God, I have tried. <laughs> to no avail. Norman remains delightfully Norman. Right? It's, 
I gotta, I gotta focus my attention on what I can do something about. I can't, I can't help it if you lie or you don't lie. Right? I can be an example for the newcomer that comes in. I can become a part of the human chain, right? That's Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can be a guy who's doing better and better and better and better. I can be an example to that guy. So when that guy comes in and says, all I hear was blah, 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 blah. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can say, oh, yeah. That's all I heard. But I can feel something here. I can feel something here. There's something that I can feel. It's palpable. It's tan. I can feel it here. You people are doing something different. What's the key to that? Doing. Doing something different. You people are living a different way. Your, your act, the action of your day is fundamentally different than mine. And I want that. How did you get that? This. What keeps me, I worked one through nine. What keeps me going? What keeps me in the game? 10, 11, and 12. I think of them all as action steps. People say, well, you know, there are the action steps, and then there, well, I think they're all action steps. 10, me, 11, God, 12, you. Nobody else to play with, right? Four and five was me. Ten is me. Six and seven was God. Eleven's God. Eight and nine was you. Twelve was you. Nice. That's kind of tight, isn't it? That's kind of covers it, doesn't it? Ten? What am I doing with ten? What am I doing? Pop quiz. Come on. <laughs> Thought you were going to get to sit there after lunch and just listen to me go on and on and on, didn't you? Come on, what are we doing in 10? Continuing to take personal inventory. Personal inventory. My inventory, not yours. And when wrong, promptly admitting it. Why promptly? Because I'll develop a resentment towards you, and we'll get around to it June. Right? I will wrong you and think, oh God, I gotta clean that up. I'll, you know, eventually. I'll make a note of some kind. You know, get to that. Wrong. I gotta get it done now. Resentment's the number one killer of people like me. I will fester and I will die. I gotta get it out of my head. I gotta get rid of it. So I review my day. The book, again, very specific. Start the day, review the day. Great stuff. Great stuff. How do, and you know what? It doesn't even have to be a day. That was a very, very interesting experience for me. I remember being new, about two years sober. I'd been going to Ohio Street um, Monday night, two, no, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Four nights a week I'd been going to Ohio Street for two years. Right behind the podium at Ohio Street is about a three-foot by four-foot painting of the Serenity Prayer. Two years after having begun to go to Ohio Street, I spotted that painting. <laughs> and I read it and I thought, you know, that's snappy. <laughs> Loving that poem. Poem to me. I call up Donald and go, Donald, the poem. And he goes, you mean a prayer? I go, yeah, 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 prayer. Yeah, prayer. There's this prayer. I read it at Ohio Street. Incredible. Shortest prayer I found. Love it. I'm going to say it now. He said, no, nope, no, you're not. He said, what are you talking about? It's the shortest thing I can find. He goes, no, nope, way too much going on there. You're going to screw that all up. I said, fine, then if I'm not allowed yet to say this, the, 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 this prayer, this serenity prayer, um, what do I got to say? He goes, here's what you want you to do. Here's your prayers. You listening? Yeah, I'm listening. He goes, all right, when you wake up every morning, before your feet touch the floor, you pull the covers down from your insane little head and you look up and you put your palms up like this and you say, whatever. <laughs> I said, I like that, that's good. I said, now when you get in bed at night and you get in the bed and you pull the covers up to your crazy little head, I want you to put your hands up like this and I want you to say, enough. <laughs> and you go to bed. <laughs> and I said, Got it. About three weeks later, 9 a.m. rolls around, and I'm done. I've had it. I called him up, and he always answered the phone. Donald Madden. Donald Earl. How are you, kid? Donald, I'm doomed. He said, how did you spot that, kid? 
He said, I'm done. I can't take it. It's 9 a.m. I'm not going to make it to tonight, man. I'm not going to make it. I'm done. It's over. I've had it. Nice effort. Thanks for your help. I'm a dead man. He says, hold it. I can help. Well, thank God, because you're the one and only call I'm making here. He says, all right, I want you to take a deep breath. <laughs> that was a deep breath for me. When I was a little constricted. He says, okay, now take a deep breath. All right, now. He goes, say enough. He said, enough. He goes, okay, wait a second. All right, take a deep breath. He said, okay, now say whatever. I went, you can do that? It's 9 a.m. He goes, so what? He goes, that day wasn't going well, was it? He said, no. He goes, then end it. And begin another one. This was like a spiritual experience for me. I'm looking at the clock going, nope, not going to make it. I didn't have to. I just had to let that go and start my day over again. I can do these things along the way. Right? That are tremendously valuable to me. These little, little, little ways of getting on through. Just getting from meeting to meeting. Getting from sponsor call to sponsor call. Getting from opportunity to sit and read the book. Let it go, take it back. Let it go, take it back. Let it go, take it back. I mean, I, I, I turn my will in my life. You know how many times I turn my will in my life over the care of God between Los Angeles and New York? I'm surprised over the loudspeaker we didn't hear, uh, okay, Earl, this is God. <laughs> Why don't you just keep it till you land, and we'll get back to it then, okay? Because this back and forth is driving me crazy. Because it's, here, God, bump. Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> oh, Jesus, here, God, bump. Yeah, it's mine. Right? It's just a nightmare <laughs> across the country. Got me, got me, got me. All that matters is, is that like Donald used to say, my, your life is like a tapestry, right? That's being, that's being sewn. I guess that's what you do with a tapestry, right? You just sew it. Have I got that right? No tapestry people? Woven. Woven. I'm writing that down. Woven. <laughs> nice. As the tapestry of your life is being woven. <laughs> my job, when the needle comes through, is to just push the needle back. Right? That's all I do, is just push the needle back. There's another way to put it. The door opens, walk through it. What's in here? I don't know. Why are you walking through it? Because the door opened. Is that reason enough? Apparently. I had a remarkable life happen as a result of just doing that. Another thing. Oh, I'm losing it. Another thing. Anyway even though I've gone quite mad while standing up here. Um, oh, it went away. Never mind. Yeah, it did. It went away. All right. Woven. Woven. No, it's just it's not going to help. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> that fell into the black hole. I just... I'm gone. Yes. Bobby A. Step 10. I'm sitting in my first step study meeting with Donald Madden. We're all being very well behaved, right? Bobby's sponsored by Donald. Bobby has uh, m um, the most time in the room under Donald, right? He sort of sits at the right hand of Donald, right? <laughs> Very impressive fellow about that tall, right? Mighty fellow. We're all very impressed with Bobby. We're very serious about the steps. Very serious. Working the steps. Quiet over there, I'm working the steps. <laughs> laughing? There is no laughing in steps. No laughing, life and death. Steps. I'm reading, we're talking about the 10th step. Oh, it is very serious. Very serious. Nobody's no screwing around in here. Get the Bobby. <laughs> Bobby says, Well, I recall the first time I heard the 10th step. Thought it was fascinating. Continue to take personal inventory, and when wrong, promptly admit it. So I immediately wrote a long letter to a friend of mine, pointing out all of his defects of character, and I apologized for not telling him sooner. <laughs> all these serious faces. Are... Eyes twitching, you know what I mean? What the hell did he just say? Right? Donald's like, ah! 
<laughs> so I think that's the greatest thing he's ever heard, right? Now we're all like completely shook up. Bobby's looking at us like, lighten up. Just lighten up. He says, that's not how I feel about it now. This is a process. This isn't fine, got it, good, go. It's a process. More is revealed as we go. He says, I don't feel that way about the step now. I preface this by saying, when I first heard it, I, w I saw it as simply an opening to give this guy a hard time. Got it. Have you noticed we've been laughing a lot in here? We've laughed a lot today, haven't we? It's the healing for us. We gotta have a good time. We gotta play a little bit. We gotta look at the stuff. If we can't laugh at us, we're screwed. Okay? Cause let's face it. Ripe for some good jokes around here, huh? <laughs> All you gotta do is go, hey, I, let's listen to one another one of Earl's good ideas when he was drinking. <laughs> right? It's like, it's hysterical. We gotta be able to laugh at this stuff. Don't get so, I can't get so, you know. Christ, you're gonna stump, stump. What did he say? What did he say? Slow down! I haven't got every word here. I'm gonna. Because when I'm done, I'm tearing this crap apart. Writing you a long letter, pal. They call central office about you. Get a little AA cease and desist order out on you, pal. <laughs> Christ almighty. Right? Put me in your inventory. Who cares? <laughs> Ten, continue to take personal inventory wrong. Why? Because I didn't get it perfect the first time around. I'm screwing up all the time. You know why I'm screwing up? Because I'm pushing the envelope. I'm not leading a safe little careful life. I'm out there mixing it up with the normies. You know what I mean? Occasionally, a little bit m more of me pops out than they're comfortable with. <laughs> And you can see it in their eyes. You know, I'll be get, I'll get, I'll be a little too tired, you know. When I get tired, it's like truth serum for me. You know what I mean? All the filters just seem to melt and I just start telling the truth. And I'll get a little animated or I'll get a little caffeine in me when I'm exhausted and I just start going. And every once in a while I'll be talking to somebody and I'll forget they're not in any. It's just somebody I know. And all of a sudden you see that look in their face, that, just that. You know, and you go, and you just think, whoops. Right, went a little too far that time. That sentence is usually ended with, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> or sometimes it even happens with new people. You gotta be careful around certain new people. There's been a lot of education in the community over the last 25 years, okay? A lot of people are getting to AA with higher bottoms. Now a lot of the old timers, you know, seem to take exception to that. I think it's remarkable. I think it's wonderful. Why should somebody have to suffer as much as I did to have a right to be here? That's crap. If you made it here, congratulations. I don't care if you dropped the champagne glass by the pool and went, oh, that's it, and then you can. <laughs> None of my business. It's not my business. I mean, all the way to the normie coming in and saying, you know what, this is cool, I want to learn from this. Book says. Anybody could get a lot out of this. Oh, we got open meetings. Why the hell shouldn't we let them come? Encourage them to stay. Encourage them to grow. Work with them. Share our experience. Drink and hope with them. But remember, some of the new ones, it happened the other day. It happened Thursday night. I was sitting in the meeting in the house, step study, little workshop thing we got going on, right? There's a newcomer girl sitting over there. She got about 23 days. And I was making a point and mentioned uh, something I'd done, right? while I was drinking and using. It was, to my way of thinking, a rather moderate tale. <laughs> I just briefly looked to my right and realized she wasn't seeing it that way. She was looking at me with absolute horror on her face. Just, And she looked at my wife, and my wife went, I don't know if she's going to come back. I don't know. <laughs> Got to be easy with the new ones. Kind of get a sense of what, you know what I mean? We don't want to jump them too hard and too furious. 
I believe that uh, uh, this isn't a cookie cutter program. We bring them in, we stamp them this way, we guide them through this, we put them through this stuff and on. I know a group somewhere in the Midwest, they're so serious about this thing, and I mean serious, that you come into their group, you get interviewed as to whether or not you're going to be in their group. If you come into their group, there's, a, there's an interview process to become a member of their group. If you join their group, you're advised to take the next 30 days off from work. Now, I don't know about you, but to think that if a newcomer's got a job, and then to actually ask them to not go to it is... <laughs> that kind of goes against the grain for me. <laughs> but, th I mean, and I mean, I, I actually did damn near an exorcism on a member of that group, getting them back out into AA. All right? I mean, the pressure that was being put on this woman was horrible. The, and the manipulation and control that was occurring. But that seems to work for some people. There's other much more moderate groups that have additional aspects to them outside what one would consider the mainstream of AA. Right? There's people in AA that are incredibly loose. There's a guy I sponsor named Britton. His, I, he came to me and asked me to sponsor him. I said, well, what's up with your first sponsor? And he said, well, he told me to work the steps unless it was a hassle. I'm thinking that's not going to work for me. I'm going to come to you. And I said, cool. Right? Well, that guy's staying sober. That guy's still sober. He works the steps unless it's a hassle. God bless him. You know? I figured that that could easily turn into I stay sober unless it's a hassle. <laughs> but that's me. That's not him. Find your way. Ten. Continue to take personal inventory and want wrong, promptly admit it. That allows me to not find myself going into a deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper state of resentment, dis-ease, disharmony, so that because I'm only going to do an inventory every five years, I'm, you know, I, that that builds over a period of five years until I get some relief. No, I want a, the daily experience of the relief being there, of this working, of being free. I don't want to slowly over time, in sobriety, gradually become tethered once again to the disease of alcoholism. I don't want to end up with the obsession of the mind returning. Now, if there's another guy I know in the program that says, I think I could stay sober and comfortable that way, doing half of the things I do. The only problem is they don't know which half that is. So I just keep doing all the stuff that I do. I'm with that guy. I'm with that guy. I have a great life as a result of what I do. If it works, don't fix it. I've always gone to lots of meetings. I've always been sponsored. I've been sponsored for every moment of my sobriety except for three hours. That's how long after Donald died I had another sponsor. I'm of service. I sponsor a lot of guys. I sponsor some remarkable people. Absolutely remarkable people. And I also sponsor not heads. I sponsor a guy who, uh, um, he's been around 12 years now. I think he's over three weeks again. And I sponsored him for 12 years. Question. If you have someone who continuously relapses, Earl, shouldn't you encourage them to seek another sponsor? Yeah. And if he doesn't go, fine. That's not my decision. It's not up to me. It's not, believe me, I'm not the weak link in his game plan. <laughs> he has been exposed to everything that is necessary to become comfortably sober and stay that way. He just doesn't choose to do it on a regular basis. So he regularly gets loaded. And then he gets to the place where he wants to put a gun in his mouth and he calls me and he comes back. And when he wants to tell me how much pain he's in, I don't listen to him. I say, let us I don't want to hear about the problem. Let's talk about the solution. I'm familiar with the pain and the madness. Let's talk about how we stay sober. Then we'll do that for a while, and he'll get relief. And the minute he gets relief, he stops doing it because he's got the relief. And then it goes away because he stopped doing it. That's the part he seems to miss. You get it because of what you're doing. Then keep doing what you're doing, and you'll keep getting it. 
You stop doing what you're doing, it's going to go away. You with me? That's amazing. All right. <laughs> so, 11. Ooh, we're getting close, aren't we? We're getting close. 11. I seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. I think it's a self-explanatory step. What do, everybody, what do I pray for? What should I be praying for? How about I pray for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out? Period. The end, thank you. Why don't I pray for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out? Now, I can pray for world peace. I can pray for a new bike on Christmas. I can pray to for her. I can pray for all of you. Anything wrong with any of these prayers so far? No. What could I pray for to take all that into account? Keep me out of the solution. Keep me out of expectation. As a result, keep me out of everything except my part in this. And put, align me in a position to be of maximum service to God and my fellows. What could I do to take all that into consideration? How about I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out? <laughs> Just right back, boom. Nice and simple. Nice and simple. Pray for that. Can I add stuff? Sure. Can I do stuff instead of that? Absolutely. Donald had a horrible prayer. He'd get mad at somebody. He'd pray for them to get what they deserve. <laughs> that was as gracious as he could be. <laughs> he used to get a kick out of it. Somebody would say something to him in, in a meeting or something that he didn't like. We'd all go, well, he's going to be praying for that guy. <laughs> Knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. That's what I pray for. That's what the step tells me to do. I seek God. It's on me. I don't stand around waiting for God to pr pr present himself to me. I seek God. It's an action step. I seek God through prayer and meditation. Now, when I went to Al S. after Donald, I sat down and we reviewed my program and he said, Earl, you're firing on all cylinders. You're doing great. You're catching the buzz. You're spreading the word. You're doing the deal, man. You're doing the deal. Love it. He goes, now about this meditation thing. Do you meditate much? I said, well, what do you mean by much? <laughs> I'm coming up on 14 years and actually not yet, no. He says, well, I think you should explore meditation. I said, okay. Being a good little AA sponsee, I was deferring to the thinking of my sponsor. I called up a friend of mine said, uh, about this meditation thing, I think we need to explore it. He said, great. We found a place that was a school for meditation. We took a six-week course on meditation, and we began to practice meditation on a daily basis. Why on earth would I, a Westerner, a linear thinker, not so much anymore, but at least my culture raises me to be that kind of way, think in a very linear fashion, not to approach this spherically at all. Don't let me get started on that. Okay. Right? I'm here. Right? I meditate to quiet the mind so that when the answers come, I can hear them. Okay? I don't get letters in the mail from God. God doesn't talk to me through the radio anymore. <laughs> but I do get a sense of what the right thing is for me to do when I pray and meditate. The answers come to me in the form of a thought, an idea, an intuition. The book tells me that I'll come to rely upon these things. This sixth sense. It comes to me through meditation. Meditation is one of the most powerful tools available to an individual like me. It is not the nature of the body to be still. It is not the nature of the mind to be quiet. When I meditate, I sit still and attempt to quiet the mind. And I, people are always coming up to me and saying, well, well, how do you do it? I mean, give me, and I say, well, you want a real, real simple, easy way to meditate? Fine. Sit down on the floor, sit cross-legged, and if you're, you know, you got a bad back, or you got this, and you can't do the lotus thing, don't worry about it. Sit in a chair. Just sit down. Sit down, get comfortable, spine straight, relaxed, 
palms up, in your lap, get loose, get easy, you know, head upright, get comfortable, close your eyes if you want to, if you don't, fine, mouth slightly open, breathe in through your nose, in, an, in a slow and easy motion where there isn't the sense of breathing. So you're not getting that, but just. And then very slowly, out through the mouth. Just very slowly. It's working already. Two guys just went like this. <laughs> All right, and you breathe in slowly, and you breathe out slowly. Right? Very simple meditation. Count from one to four. One, two, out with two, in with three, out with four. And then start again. In with one, out with two, in with three, out with four. I will guarantee you that the majority of the people in this room, when I just counted from one to four twice, didn't stay with me. You thought about something else. You found some way to object to that. You were in conflict on some level with it. Or you simply just started to think about him or her or it or when or how or under what circumstances. You just went into something else. Because that's what we do. This isn't about getting good at staying on one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four for the next 20 minutes. This is about recognizing when you've wandered off, accepting and acknowledging that and coming back to one, two, three, four. It's not about staying at one, two, three, four. It's about being willing to come back to it. Because you're never going to stay there. We wander. The body's being still. The body doesn't like to be still. The brain subconsciously, while well, you're counting to four, will say, tighten up his left butt cheek. <laughs> and you'll go, one, two, God, my ass hurts. <laughs> Never mind that. Back to one, two, three, four. Back you go. One, two. Girl in the fourth row is very attractive. Oh, sorry. One, two, the guy over there to the left laughs a lot. I like him. He seems to be pleased with me. That's all that's required for me to like you. Shit! All right, wait. One, two, you just, right? It's the nature of the mind to scurry about. The body doesn't want to sit still, right? When the glute tension didn't do it, right? It'll say, make his left foot cold. What? Why the hell is my left foot cold? Because your brain's trying to get your ass up out of the chair to go do something. You can't sit still, be quiet. But if you keep coming back to this and just experience your resistance to it, which is fascinating when you think about it, that you can't sit still and be quiet for five minutes. That's alarming. That's absolutely alarming. You start to see the urgent need for the meditation. So you sit and you begin. And this will happen to you. If you do this every morning, it's going to come. You're going to sit down and you're going to count the four once. You're going to open your eyes and it's been 20 minutes. And you're going to feel a lot. You woke up exhausted and you sat there for 20 minutes and you got up and you feel balanced. You feel peaceful. You feel calm. But you feel a great sense of energy. Not the caffeine kick, right? This steady, smooth, easy energy is there for you. And you're going to go... Wow. And you're going to be very, very comfortable with decisions that have to be made that you were really stressing about. Because it's just clear that this is the right thing to do for you and you can make the decision and then let it go. And not sit there second-guessing yourself for the next two days. You can make the decision and move on with your life. Next. Bring it. Next. And it's okay. And it's a remarkably powerful tool. Prayer and meditation. I seek God through these things. Why do I do that? Because without God, I'm in charge. Need I say more? <laughs> Bad situation. Earl's in charge. Oh, God. <laughs> We've seen his handiwork. Back to prayer. Turn it over to God. Give it to God. Give it to God. Whatever. That's a great prayer, by the way. Whatever. What does it say? Whatever. I surrender. Screw it. Take it. It's up to you. I'm your humble servant. Thy will, not mine, be done. 
I'm just going to go out here and attempt to maximize my service to you and to my fellows. I'm going to go to these meetings not to take from them, but to see what I can bring to them. So that when the newcomer walks in and goes, anybody in here got what I need? Yep. And it has nothing to do with my best thinking. Good news for us all. That's cool, right? So that's what I do. I seek God through prayer and meditation to improve, to continually, to constantly, to hopefully, without ceasing, improve my conscious contact. Contact at awake. Conscious. Here. Now. Conscious of a contact with a power greater than myself. You bet. You bet. I have relationships with a few of the people in this room. Right? I can assure you that the nature of those relationships is remarkable to me. Some of the stories I can tell you about things that we've done. Right? A buddy of mine that I haven't seen in a while, I saw him last Friday the 13th when I came here. And I said, and he walked in today after the break, and I got to see him. And whenever I see this guy, it just lights me up. He's not in the room right now. He's in the back, so I can talk about him. So when he comes in, shh. His name's Steve. Right? I love this guy. We never talk. We don't have to. He's on the planet. It's a better place for me. I love him. I just love him. We were sitting on a beach in the Bahamas one day, right? First of all, <laughs> need I say more than that, right? This maniac and I are sitting on a beach in the Bahamas. It's beautiful sands, water, birds, rocks. I mean, we're paradise, two pagans in the middle of paradise, right? And we're sitting there. This is back when we, we smoked, and I, and I said, uh, he said, so you've been smoking these Cuban cigars? And I said, yeah, tasty, huh? Yeah, I love them. That's great. And we're on a, we're, we're, we're on a little island in the Bahamas, and uh, I think it was called Eleuthera, right? That sounds like an illness, you know, not an island. But there we were. Beautiful place. And I said, you think we could get some? Now, there's a couple of dope fiends, right? In an hour, we found Cuban cigars. We got up off the beach, got a ride into town, immediately went to the liquor store. Found a couple of guys. Says, you know a guy that would know a guy that could get us right? We went. We, we need to tap into the Bahamian underground, right? <laughs> We're tapped in in eight minutes. <laughs> we go through a store to the back of the store to meet Mama So-and-so, who knows the guy who says the word to the bartender over at the club So-and-so, owned by the underworld kingpin of this particular island. We go we, to the bar, you know, go blue. Great. Box of Cubans comes out. Right. They open it up. You know, we take six or seven of them, pay the guy back in the cab, back. We're back on the beach within an hour smoking Cuban cigars. You've got to love this guy. That's history between us. We're sitting there just laughing at each other, right? Old habits die hard, bro. <laughs> you know? He just tapped right in and do that. And we had a blast. And that same guy now sit over dinner. And what we talk about is his daughter. And how much he loves his daughter. And how he's being a good father to his daughter. Right? And then you meet his daughter. And you see how she talks to him. And you know, God, this child's in good hands. <laughs> right? How can I not love this man? Right? Do I need to talk to him every day? No. We're on the same path together. I know what he's doing. He knows what I'm doing. We see each other. The other day he emailed me for the first time. And it was a picture of him with a very prominent politician. <laughs> It's hysterical. Standing there with his arm around this politician, right? Talk about worlds colliding, right? <laughs> and I've got this picture, and I just sat there and laughed, and I had tears in my eyes, though, about how the world is our oyster, man. I jump in and can have this thing. If I continue to take personal inventory, and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it, I stay clean, and I can go out there and do anything. If I seek God through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out, if I'm doing that, I'm cool. I can get out there and jump in the game. Now, I got one thing left. But when you look at that triangle with a circle around it, right, mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being, therein lies the balance that I seek but can't find, drunk or sober, right? And that AA adopted that symbol and unity is the body, I bring it here. I must be with my fellows. Recoveries of the mind that work these steps. That twelfth step, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of working these steps, having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, Having been relieved of the obsession to drink and use. 
free. Third side of the triangle, spiritual. Service. I can practice these principles in all my affairs. Right? Which is what we're going to talk about when we come back. Step 12. Right. All right, I got another question. The question is, how many meetings should a newcomer go to? I, let me put it this way. I, I uh, do some work with uh, some sober living homes out in uh, my area, about an hour from where I live, and um, they require a lot of meetings. If you're, uh, if you're going to, uh, um, if you're working full time, they require a minimum of 14 meetings a week. All right? The message is this. Nothing, nothing gets in the way to a, of a constant com connection and commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous. Working full time, terrific. Then you'll only do 14 meetings this week. <laughs> Get what I'm saying? So those guys are at the 6.15 a.m. meeting and they go to the 6.15 to 17 a.m. meeting at the 502 Club before they go to work. After work, very easy to hit at least one of the many, many meetings that are being conducted in that immediate area. Weekends, doubling up shouldn't be a problem. So two a day is nothing. The record is held by John C. 54 meetings in one week. So, if you're a newcomer, I would suggest a meeting a day. Suddenly? Doesn't sound like much, does it? <laughs> Go to a meeting a day. Why not? I think in the beginning, I mean, what we're doing in the beginning is different than any other time. What we're doing in the beginning is building a foundation upon which we will stand free men and women. Free of the beast. Free of the enslavement of alcoholism and drug addiction. Right? We're well, building that foundation. I would suggest that it requires constant involvement. Right? I mean, I don't want to build an okay foundation. I want to know that my foundation kicks ass. That's what I want to know. So I'm going to be involved on a daily basis. I'm calling my sponsor every day. I'm doing what he asks. I'm going to a meeting a day. I went to, they said, if, if they had said to me, Earl, I want you to go to a meeting a day for your first five years. We'll talk again then. I would have said, okay, you clearly you're still drinking because I ain't doing that. The fact of the matter is I went to way more meetings than one meeting a day for my first five years. Way more. Because I was doubling up on the weekends because I was hanging with my new friends, these sober guys. I was chasing her. She was sober. I needed to look very, very sober. All the wrong reasons. I'm building a very solid foundation. <laughs> Again, what gets you there? People say, well, you know, I don't know if that's a good way to get to AA. Please. I don't care how you get here. Well, I'm here because the judge made me come. Perfect. I got here because I thought it was a good idea. Perfect. I'm here so my wife won't leave me. Perfect. How you get here? How you get here? What causes you to stay? Perfect. Right? This ain't about the mindset. You're not going to think your way into right action. You're going to act your way into right thinking. That's what you're going to do. Just the, It's about footwork, man. That the free feet bring the head. Let's face it, when you get here, if you're anything like me, you may have kicked. You may have kicked. You may not have kicked. But you, let's say the worst case scenario, you come here and you kick, go into meetings. Now, you've kicked. You've dealt with the, the lesser aspect of your disease. You're not sitting in AA meetings with a head full of alcoholism, right? Beast is whispering in your ear. Oh, he's look beast, beast the angling. What? It's he's looking right at you, smiling. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Okay. It's just, it's going on in here. Fine, you brought him here. The ones that I love are the meetings where you go into and the guy raises his hand and says, uh, "Earl, um, the beast is talking to me right now." I mean, it's so loud, I'm surprised you guys can't hear it. Right? It's absolutely unbelievable because you know the beast has sworn you to secrecy and here you are talking out in plain view of other recovering alcoholics. 
Beast is like, oh, great, that was smooth. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're going I thought we were between us. If you're going to do this, and we're, you know what? We're not talking. Excellent. Excellent. Bring it on out in the room. I love the guy who shares his hand and says, Bill, alcoholic. Came here today to tell you all to fuck off. <laughs> hate you. Hate alcoholics. And I don't hate you as a group. I hate each and every one of you individually. <laughs> hate AA. Hate your pedestrian little book. Hate it all. Came here to let you know that's where I'm at. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Half the room goes, well, all right, Bill. Way to go, man. Keep coming back, you sorry son of a bitch. <laughs> I love that guy. Because you know what? That guy felt like that at home. And he got up off his ass, got in his car, and went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, would anybody like to share? He simply responded. <laughs> and told them the truth. He's not doing so bad, is he? Yes, he has a bad attitude. How shocking. <laughs> that one of us would have a bad attitude. And he's telling the truth. You go back six months later, right? Guess who's making the coffee there? <laughs> and doubling is the GSR. He is. <laughs> I remember going out to that Tuesday night workshop that I did for five years straight, on sabbatical now. And they brought in a guy who was in the house... Big Frank. Big Frank is an Hispanic gentleman. Big Frank been gang banging his whole life. Big Frank's been in the system since he was a kid. All right. Big Frank got ink. Big first thing you meet on Big Frank is his neck. You know. I walk up and said, Frank, how you doing? He goes, uh, Come here, you. Let me get, let's get something straight. I am here so that I don't do time. This is why I'm here. Mr. Little White Man. <laughs> and I am going to, you say go left, I will go left. I will do everything that you suggest to me to do. I will be in total compliance with the program here at this sober living facility. I will do everything I got. But the minute I got this beef off my back, the minute my case is resolved, I'm getting high. Are we clear? I said, Big Frank, we are clear. Now, since you're going to be here for a year, what you say you and I talk a little bit between now and then? Whatever floats your boat, little white man. <laughs> Off Frank goes, right? Now, Frank was in the back of the meeting, and every day on Tuesday, I'd come in and say, Frank, how you doing? <laughs> Apparently, that's just Frank's way of saying hello, I, you know? <laughs> Frank and I talked about it a little bit every Tuesday night for a year. I am Frank's sponsor now. Frank just celebrated four years of sobriety. Not because I'm a sponsor, but because Frank was willing to talk about it. Frank was willing to take the actions that were requested of him during the course of that year. And as a result, the change occurred, and Frank is a free man. Frank and I hugged each other and cried when Frank came to me and said, my probation officer has lifted my probation. I'm no longer required to be anywhere or answer to anyone. To which I replied, except me and God. Right, Frank? <laughs> and he said, well, God. <laughs> and he's a beautiful human being. And I love Frank. And I look at him and Frank says, and Frank, Frank this, here's, you walk into a meeting now and when you see Frank, this is what Frank is doing. Okay, I say, here's what you do, man. I want you to read the doctor's opinion, all right? And I want you to read the first eight pages of Bill's story, then you call me right away, okay? And I'm not talking about tomorrow, all right? I'm talking about tonight, all right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, right? I got a problem with God? I think not. Big Frank, carrying the message, man. He's fierce. Frank's like, he's like a modern day samurai to me, man. The guy's huge. He's an amazing human being. Doctor told Frank, Frank, you gotta lose some, big Frank gotta lose some weight. Frank's heart's about to stop. His vision getting blurred. I mean, bad stuff happening, right? Frank said, okay. Frank lost a hundred pounds. 
He's still Big Frank. But he's a much smaller version. I said, how'd you do that? He said, one day at a time, man. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. And how cool is this guy, right? I also sponsor Satan. I do. His name is Lewis Offer. Lucifer, that's his real name. Lou Offer. Um, he's got a shaved head and two horns of red hair shellacked up into horns. He's got a little beard that swirls down into a point and kind of tips up at the end, right? down about here. He's got a devil's tail tattooed up his back. He's got flames tattooed on his legs like he's standing in the fires of hell. And I spoke in a meeting one night, and this dude comes walking up and says, Bro, you got to sponsor me. Now, immediately, I become greatly concerned about what it is I'm throwing out there. Because clearly, Satan sees that I'm his guy, right? And I have sponsored him. Um, uh, Louis just celebrated 10 years of sobriety. Louis is an amazing human being. Sponsors a lot of guys, helps a lot of people. When, when those little speed freaks on, on Hollywood Boulevard, out in Hollywood, right? I mean, these guys are 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, and they come screaming into the midnight madness meetings in Hollywood, and I mean just in time. If you can imagine 15 years old and getting here just in time. Come tweaking in off that street in those midnight madness meetings. Man, they look around and go, holy shit, the devil got sober. <laughs> they see Louis standing over there with the horns and the whole thing, right? <laughs> Louie goes walking over and puts his arm around him and says, all right, little bro, you don't ever have to get loaded again one day at a time if you don't want it. And I just want to cry when I see that. And they look at him and they go, I am so into this. <laughs> right? Now, I could walk up to them and say, little brother, uh, my name's Earl. I got 22 years clean and sober, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to catch this buzz that is more fierce than anything you have ever known in your life. And they'll look at me and go, yeah, 22 years, right. Either you didn't use like me, or there's, you're lying. There's a lost weekend in there somewhere. <laughs> they'll believe Louie. They don't believe me, they'll believe him. And they don't know that when they, they, and they pass on me and sit down with Louie, they just move to another seat at the same table. And who cares? They say, bro, I gotta pass, I'm gonna go with Lou. I say, okay. <laughs> I just smile and go, alright. That's a big shift in game plan, pal. Right? <laughs> Right? And we all end up, brothers and sisters, doing the same deal, man. The common problem and the common solution drawing us closer and closer together. Step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of doing these steps, that was the whole point. Having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, relieved of the obsession to drink and use. Walking the earth a free man. What do I do? Because I've been coming Alcoholics Anonymous and going to these meetings and talking to this sponsor, going to these book days, and I've been take, 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 take from you which is precisely what I should have been doing. It's taken from you. Right? When Donald looked at me and said, Earl, Earl, it's really not necessary that you share because you don't have anything we want. <laughs> that was a fair and reasonable statement. Sit down, shut up, and listen was really applicable to me. And when they said to me to do that, it was really the kinder, gentler thing to say. If they had said, well, Earl, what do you think? Earl... If my sponsor had called me and said, Earl, would you like to go to a meeting? Would you like to go? Or, Earl, we're, gonna, we're, we're all going to go to a meeting over here. Would you like to join us? This never, ever happened. I would come home from work and I'd hit the answering machine and it would be Donald. Donald Madden, we're meeting at 2nd in Santa Monica at 8 o'clock. The meeting starts at 8.30. You be there by 8. Click. Well, thanks for the invitation. I would go be there at 8. The meeting's at 8.30. Why am I here at 8? Because there's people here that are newer than you, if you can believe that. There's people here that know, actually know even less than you. Maybe you can help them out. Get out of your self-centered little brain and help them out. Glad I asked, Donald. Thanks. Go be there for somebody else, right? Oh, okay. And go and do. It was, he said, go pick up Ed. He's on the corner of 2nd and Santa Monica, 6th and Santa Monica. Pick him up and bring him to Ohio Street. Fine. Click. I just go and I do it. And what happened was I got introduced to contrary action. Nobody asked me what I thought, what my best thinking was on this. We all knew it sucked. We're going to go with his best thinking. That's the great thing about a sponsor. Use the best thinking of another. 
That's the, one of the great surrenders around here, to be willing to go with the best thinking of another. One who has what it is I seek. Comfortable sobriety. Someone who's comfortable sober. Somebody who's free. Somebody who's been relieved of the obsession of drink and use. That's what I'm after. The rest of you hear that? Oh, good. That's good. That's good. But I'm getting really, really tired, man. Because the bells are starting. I, if it's just me, I can roll with it. Don't, I mean, I got lots of experience. <sighs> okay. Right, we ask people to turn their cell phones off. Thank you. You saw me go away right there. Didn't you, didn't you just see it happen? I remember being in an AA meeting in the back of Ohio Street on a Saturday night, and I couldn't go another step. It was about two years sober. I was done. Saturday night. Couldn't do it. Done. It's too hard. It's too damn hard. And I just was caving in. You know, I was just caving in. I couldn't move. And Donald saw me. The main speaker's up talking. And he gets up and he walks up to the podium and he taps the speaker on the shoulder in the middle of his talk. The guy steps aside and he gets up at the podium and he goes, Oh! And I'm the back of the thing. So, fuck. And he, we're having a meeting. Right, okay. Now everybody else in the meeting is going, who the hell is Earl? Right? Because I don't talk to anybody but Donald. I don't. I never took a chip. I didn't take a cake till I was three years sober. Didn't say a word in AA till I was two and a half. I'm a slow burn, man. I'm a slow burn. But I'm still here. Because every time it came down to the wire, every time a line got drawn in the sand, I stepped over it. Somebody said to me, how can you get through the fear of letting go? How do you get over the fear of letting go? To be able to let go. And I said, you don't. You let go in the face of it. We don't wait till we're not afraid to do stuff around here. We do it in the face of that fear. We take action in the face of the fear. That's how the fear gets relieved. You get what I'm saying? It's the action. You don't have to like it. You don't have to think it's a good idea, Earl. You just have to do it. So I do it. I do it all. I have the awakening. I'm free to the beast. The beast leaves. I'm done. Right? I'm able to, on a daily basis, engage in the behavior that makes it possible for me to walk the earth free of the obsession of drink and use. I have addressed the obsession of the mind and the allergy of the body. Life's just getting more and more and more miraculous. I've been coming to AA all this time to take, and I've been given precisely what I need. What do I do? I now go to meetings to give. I now take the place of the ones who've gone before me. I now go to the meeting, and I am not there to take from the meeting, but I am there to be of service to that meeting. I'm there to be an example of what can happen. I stand there just buzzing away. And the newcomers come in and go, what's that vibe? Right? Because Fred Ellis is gone. I can't tell him, go stand behind Fred Ellis after the meeting at Thursday Night Brentwood Beginners Workshop and check that buzz out. Because Fred's gone. But Fred gave that buzz to a lot of men. You can go to that meeting now and there's other guys. There's other guys I can point to. Go listen to him. Go listen to him. When we go to a meeting and a certain guy's speaking and I say to my boys, phaser shields down, boys. This one's safe. Just... Let it happen. Soak this man in. Because he's going to throw down. He's going to tell you the real deal. He's going to talk about trusting God, cleaning house, and helping others. And he got in you, right? I was in Texas earlier this year, right? And I go walk in the room and Cersei's sitting there. Cersei's 92 years old. Been married to the same woman for 68 years. Sober 57 years. Now, AA is only what? 66? Is that right? 67? Last July? Last June? June 10th? I got a few things left in here. <laughs> Cersei says, Oh, what are you doing here? I said, Jesus, Cersei knows my name. <laughs> Hi, Cersei. I tell them in tech, they should get Cersei a ring so we got something to kiss when we see him. All right? Because Cersei used to travel, Cersei and his wife and Bill W. and his wife used to travel together. They were traveling buddies, right? Back in the beginning days, right? And, and I had 
Flashback 17 years. I'm five years sober. I'm five years sober. I've gone nothing but AA meetings. People are saying, let's go to this conference. Let's do this, 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 this. No, 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 man. i got to go to a meeting. I was so afraid of changing anything that I was going to get loaded. I just went to meetings. I'm going to meetings. I'm going to meetings. And I took a chance and I said there was a conference that was like 20 minutes south of where I was living. And I got my little car, man. I drove down there. I paid my thing. And I went in and I snuck into the back of this meeting, which just terrified me. There was like 2,000 people in this room. And there was a guy named Franklin W. from Olive Branch, Mississippi, standing up there. Sharing away. And I'm in the back, and all of a sudden, Franklin W. says, I'll sum up Alcoholics Anonymous for you in six words. Those six words being, trust God, clean house, help others. And it blew the top of my head off. I had a spiritual experience standing right there. That's It all fits, doesn't it? All the little things we've been talking about all day. Bam, there they are. Trust God, clean house, help others. Me, God, and you. Steps, the whole nine yards. It's there. It's right there. The action plan. What I do in meetings. How I function on a daily basis from the moment I open my eyes till I go to bed at night. Trust God, clean house, help others. I stay in there. I'm on it. So I go vibrating out of that deal and I go on about my life. And I'm thinking, I got this from this guy. I don't even know who the hell this guy is. Trust God, clean house, help others. Franklin W. from Olive Branch, Mississippi. It's like branded in my brain, right? And I'm going along. 17 years later, I'm in Texas. I run into Searcy. Searcy says, come here, boy. How you doing? Good, man. Doing this, doing this. So I said, what's going on? So she goes, well, I was just having a conversation with this guy over here. I was talking to him about how, uh, um, how well, back in the old days when I was hanging out with Bill and stuff, you know, I get goosebumps. Whoa. Hanging out with Bill. That doesn't come up in conversations a lot, guys I know. Well, I was hanging out with Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, the largest spiritual movement on the planet today. I mean, it's just an amazing thing that this guy was talking about, right? Because, yeah, we were traveling, we, were, we posed the question, because, you know, there was this guy, Franklin W. More goosebumps, right? Franklin W. Oh, it's getting weird, right? He used to go around and we talking about stuff, and he goes, you know, he was carrying one of the original circuit speaker guys. And, and, and it, it, it came out of a conversation that Cersei was having with Bill, and he said, you know what? I wonder what it is, what program it is that we will, we will give to the generations that are yet to come. I mean, the world changes. Things change, right? What, what is it? What is the common denominator? What is the core of the heart? of this thing that we will pass to the future generations that have yet to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bill said, well, that's easy. Trust God, clean house, help others. Get the top of my head blown off again, 17 years later, talking to, well, actually 16 years later, before I turned 22, um, in Texas earlier this year, by Searcy. Um, see, the, how, do I, how do you explain this concisely, you know? How do you explain that this is about raising the dead, man? How do you explain how that happened? Well, it's simple. You know, you trust God, you clean house, you help others. Mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance we seek, right? How an individual is absolutely, completely, and totally addicted, enslaved by alcohol and drugs could rise up out of a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Now, interestingly enough, something that remains, in fact, a hopeless state of mind and body for the great majority of us. We come into these rooms and we think this, and this becomes the norm for us. Sober people. People get drunk, they come to AA, they get sober, and live happily ever after. That ain't the case. From right here, you could probably throw a rock and hit a hundred people for every one in here that knows they're alcoholic, would love to stop drinking, and can't. Because it's got them by the throat. This isn't the common experience. This is our common experience, but that's us. That's not all alcoholics. This is a rare, remarkable gift. And what I'm asked for this incredible, remarkable blessing in my life is that I engage in this process to go steps 1 through 11. Having had the experience, having been given the remarkable thing, having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, having been relieved of the obsession to drink, freed from the beast, finally, after 16 years of mayhem, I'm asked to practice these principles and carry the message. I'm asked to go back to these meetings that have saved my life, to these people that have saved my life, and pick up the torch that they have set down because they have passed on. To be the one that carries the message of the original 100. To be that guy now, not to be the one who to benefits from it, but, but be the one who is willing to pass that on. It's the only thing Donald Madden never asked of me. So I'll give you everything I've got. Everything. I'm going to ask one thing of you. When you catch this buzz, when it lights up your life, 
when it goes so far past not drinking and using it's blowing your mind on a daily basis. When you catch that buzz, I want you to give freely to the next guy coming through the door as it's been freely given to you. And I promised him that I would do that. And I've honored that promise every day since. Every day since. And he's been dead eight years. Last July 26th. And uh, I will honor that one day at a time until the day I die. Why? Because it works. You can say whatever else you want about this thing, but you must say, and it works. If we work it. The 12th step is an opportunity. What it does is it proves to me that I can view life in a completely different manner. An example. How many of you were forced at some time during the course of your life to stand in lines? <laughs> when you go to the market, you have to stand in a line. When you go to the DMV, you have to stand in a line. When you go to the movies, you have to stand in a line. When you cross a bridge, you got to wait in line, don't you? May I suggest that you don't have to, that you get to. You're going to wait either way. You can choose to have to wait if you wish. I choose to get to wait. I get to change the way I perceive it. That I get to be a man among men. I'm not locked in a cage. I'm not buried. I've lived two decades beyond anything anybody expected. I ran into an old family friend not too long ago who said to me, you know we're, old, we're very proud of you. And I said, why? Because pride's got nothing to do with my life. And they said, she's a normie. And she said, well, you know, we had to let you go. We loved you, but we had to let you go, all of us. We all let you go. Because it was too painful to watch. And there was no way you were going to survive the course of your life. And we knew it and we accepted it and we let you go. You were 27 years old. I'm 50. Yeah, I know you're shocked to hear that. Because I look so wonderful. <laughs> Heroin is a remarkable preservative. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? Look, it's huge, this thing. This goes so far past not drinking and using. There's a buzz here so powerful. And all you got to do is get here. Right here, right now. See, this is the thing right here, right now that I, I, I lost. That's what alcohol and drugs took away from me. Because right here, right now, I'm, I'm self-centered and I'm afraid. Right here, right now, I'm comparing my insides to your outsides and I'm losing every time. Right here, right now, I can't do it. I'm too frightened. But you put drugs and alcohol in me and I feel like I can function in the world. Ultimately, what it does is it takes right here, right now away from me. I like to think that I like alcohol, heroin, barbiturates. These are a few of my favorite things, right? This is why I like to go down and out. My idea of a good night's just sitting around checking my pulse. That's a good night. But if you don't have any of that, I'll take the cocaine. Right? Can't go down, let's go up. Because it's not about down or up, it's about getting out of right here, right now. And right here, right now is all there is. There's nothing else. This is it. Now, this is where I'm going to know dignity as a man. This is where I'm going to experience freedom. This is where I'm going to know peace. This is where I'm going to love you. This is where I'm going to feel love. Something I never felt in my life before coming here. It's an amazing, warm, nurturing feeling. It's like a blanket. It's a remarkable thing. Now. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me back now. Right now. I lost it to the beast. Got it back here. Nothing can happen at any other time than right now. So when I go to a meeting with whatever attitude I have, and I sit down and some guy comes up to me and says, Earl, can I ask you a question? Or thanks, you said this and thanks or that. I feel like I have purpose and I have value in my life. And I came here without either. What I discover in the doing of it and in the being of service and going back to take, give instead of take, is I start to find where the real buzz is. It is 
in working with the new people. It is in being feeling like I'm in the game because I'm willing to face my worst fear to come here. You know? And then I'll get on another plane tomorrow. I landed here and I was thinking about, you know, I've never seen the United States. I could get a car and drive home. Because I don't want to do that again. And I'll get on the plane. I'll get on the plane and I'll fly home. Right? And I'll get home and I'll be exhausted and I'll get up money. And you want to know something? I'm not doing any of it because I'm a good guy. It's got nothing to do with it. I'm not doing it because I'm a fine example of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know why I'm doing it? Because I'm catching such a powerful buzz being one of you. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it up. I like the buzz. I'm as big a pig sober as I was using. I was never interested in the little bitty baby buzz out there. I, you never heard me say, no thanks, I've had enough. <laughs> if you can say it, it's not true. <laughs> he understands, right? Uh-uh, man. I never said, no more for me, I'm driving. <laughs> never said that. Never. No, no, that, you can have that last little bit, I'm fine over here. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Never said that. And I'm not any different in here. Right? I work all 12 steps in order. I go to regular meetings regularly. I look my sponsor in the eye every Monday night. I do what he says he asks me to do. I say yes to AA requests far beyond what anybody in my personal life seems to think is reasonable. I thank them for sharing. I'm catching a huge buzz. I was exhausted when I got here. I was exhausted. Perfect example. Last night. I'm exhausted. The guy picks me up. It takes an hour and 50 minutes to go to the hotel. I get to the hotel. I go upstairs. My ho You can touch the wall in the room. Right? There's a single bed. A little TV. I'm very fortunate, apparently, to have my own bath. You know, you think? The lobby's fabulous. But once you're in, new is a whole new awakening when you hit your floor, right? This is. And he was looking at me like, "Oh Lord, just hang with me, right?" And I get there and I look at this room and I go, what "The hell is this shoebox? Never been in a hotel room this small for Christ's sake. Bathroom's bigger than the room." How am I supposed to watch that TV from there? I can't. What, what? I mean, literally, the single bed is half the room. Right? My nightstand is my suitcase. <laughs> with the, with the, and I'm thinking, Jesus Christ. And then I'm exhausted, right? And then the street noise. Apparently, you're all shooting at each other all the time because the sirens are endless. The sirens are going and the ambulances and the police. And it's just, and they're all, apparently this is all happening on my block. Because, I mean, I got two hours sleep. But you know what happened to me in the middle of the night? I'm laying there and I thought to myself, you can look at this any way you want. And I remembered being in boarding school when I first started getting loaded in my dorm room. It's about that size. And I remember being in that dorm room and being miserable all the time. Has nothing changed? Earl, has nothing changed? Or can you be quite comfortable here? And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's warm enough in here. I don't feel cold. The TV, by God, it's a color TV. <laughs> right? The bathroom, lovely. The bed, nobody in it but me, plenty of room. Right? Suddenly, I like my hotel room. I was going to go downtown, downstairs to the lobby. I had figured it out in my head. I would go downstairs. And I would simply say, I'm in New York. I'd try to get a little New Yorkish about it. And I would say, okay, and I'd say, hi, Earl H. 1616, the room sucks. Give me another room. Not can you get me another room, just get me another room. It doesn't have to be in this building. It can be in another hotel. Just you get it. I'm not, by the time I got up this morning and went downstairs, the front desk said, how are you? I said, fabulous. Having fun. I'm kind of high. I've had two hours sleep. I'm going to go sit in front of a bunch of people and talk about strange things. It's going to be great. 
I feel okay, right? I go to the lobby. There's a couple of people there to meet me. I didn't know them, but I knew who they were the minute I saw them. A bunch of people in the lobby. I went, there they are. There they are. There they are. <laughs> and, How you doing? Good. I haven't slept. Room like a shoebox. It's okay. Let's go. Huh? Look forward to going back to my little room. Very little care is needed to keep it very neat and tidy. <laughs> right? You get that you, you pick your perception of things. What's going to work for you? Life on life's terms is life on life's terms. The 12 step gets me out of myself, has me being of service to other people. How to self more God, whether I believe in God, understand God, irrelevant. It's happening. I can just out of self more God, out of self more God. It's going, it's working. I'm in the world. I'm having fun. I'm allowed to change my perception of everything as a result of this process. I'm able to look at it any way I want. It's, it is what it is, right? I don't have to go into denial and say, well, Earl, that's crazy. You're not in reality here. Hell, I'm not. I'm a completely reality-based guy. But I can see the positive in things when before I couldn't see it, which makes my life better. I'm having a very good time, as you can see. Right? Right now, my left leg is completely numb. I cannot feel my left leg. I've been standing here all day while you guys lounge comfortably in your little auditorium seats. That's why I get paid the big dough to stand up here. <laughs> but guess what? All you got today was me. Look what I got. Look what I got. Sure, are you. Look at Marvin. You want to hug me? Thank you. <laughs> no, I brought you here, but that was great. <laughs> Look at that. How cool is that? That's what I've been looking at all day. Y'all should be up here. It's incredible. But then you wouldn't be able to see you out there, so forget it. <laughs> Look at them. Powerful. See, they're such a powerful group. Those are drug addicts and alcoholics. All of them. They're drug addicts and alcoholics. This is Maggie. <laughs> You know how they are, how nice and pleasant they are? Uh-huh. They say, hi, Maggie. Isn't this nice? I mean, isn't it amazing? Look at him. Look at Norman smiling over there. He's actually hey, asleep. <laughs> He's able to do that. Right? Should be dead. They're not. Saturday, it's raining outside. You stay home on a Saturday when it's raining outside. Right? Look at them all here. Who they come to see? A total stranger babbling idiot from Los Angeles. We all know those people are crazy. California people. And there they are. Look at them. Being supportive of me, smiling at me. I love them. Are they nice? Thanks. I get you. I get Tony and Tom. I get Steve. I get all these guys, right? I get Norman over here. I get these guys. The guys that I had lunch with. I had lunch with a bunch of guys. We had this great time, right? Everybody eating. Everybody together. Talking about being alive and sober and free. That's what we're doing. If you're new, and some of you are here, I met somebody with 51 days during one of the little breaks, right? Congratulations. Yeah, there you are. Congratulations, you know? Turn around and walk back in the teeth of your disease. Be involved in something like this above and beyond, going to meetings, you know? It's not required of you, but there's a buzz to be had here. The people in this room are the ones that are getting it. There was a woman who came to me. It was great, too, and I get, I, you give so freely to me. The last break, I'm walking up and I'm talking to Jackie, and Jackie goes, you know, the way I, the way I do it is, I think that when I, when I pray, I'm talking to God. And when I meditate, I'm listening to God. And I thought, I love that. I gotta pass that on to them. That basically is how I got all the information I've passed on to you today. It's from others who walk this path with us. Everything I've got. None of this. I didn't come here with any of this. I got it here. So it's available to all of us. We just pass it around and share it. It's our truth. It's our experience. It's our journey. So participate as best as you can. 
be a part of this. Laugh with us, the healing. Have a good time. Revel in it. Don't take yourselves too seriously, but take this very seriously. Right? It's got to be fun, man. Make it fun. There's only one thing in this book that they say they insist on. We absolutely insist upon enjoying life. That's the only thing in here that they insist on. And I suggest that that's precisely what we should do. So when you find yourself unavoidably in a line, you get to be in the line. When you find yourself unavoidably in traffic, good, you get to stop for just a little bit. Right? More music. More quiet. The options available to you. When you got here, weren't you the kind of person that when you were in the apartment, the TV had to be on at all times? When you're in the car, the radio had to be on at all times? God forbid you should be left with the sound of what's inside your head. You've got to be distracted at all times. How nice now to be able to drive down the road and just be quiet. Right? I kept saying that the place that I'm trying to get to in my life is that when they say, Earl, we're going to put you in this little box and we're going to put you there for 24 hours. You can take everything you need to be happy, to have a great time. To, to, you, you can take anything you want with you into the box. Just give us the list and we'll give it to you. For me to have a blast in the box, all I need is some water. That's it. I don't need anything else. I've been trying to get the list as short as I can possibly get it. So I can be happy, joyous, and free without the need of outside components. Me, from the inside out. My mind. Get to be me in there. Comfortable. Having a good time. Digging it. Catching a buzz. What do I need? A little water would be nice for 24 hours. But that's all I need. That's a cool thing. The list used to be extremely long. It's not anymore. That's freedom for a guy like me. Right? I'm just, I'm fine. And it's a result of being with you. I hope you got something out of this. I've really enjoyed being with you and I wish you peace. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.